Excellent. Okay, so welcome everyone to this tutorial uh, uh, on efficient static analysis and verification of feature transition systems. Um, so this tutorial will be presented by, well, I mean, it was developed by six persons and not all of us will be presenting because there will be too much changing, let's say. Um, but I will give you a small introduction of, uh, of the presenters. I uh, would also like, so for those of you who joined in a little later, so uh, please interrupt if you have any questions, not on this part, of course, but on the, on the material. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question or, or otherwise uh, post, post it in the chat. But I mean, the best is unmuting because I immediately get the message. Okay, so uh, the tutorial is, so uh, me, I'm Maurice Terbeek, um, researcher here, at, I'm currently here. Unfortunately, we're not doing this, uh, this conference uh, in presence. So I'm here in Italy, in Pisa. And uh, well, I originally from the Netherlands and uh, I work on formal methods, model checking and all kinds of stuff and also software product line engineering. So another colleague of mine who's here, uh, well, is actually not in Pisa now, but uh, close is Franco Mazzanti, who will be doing a demo later on, on, the, on one of the model checking tools, a colleague in my group, and the main developer of the, of the model checking framework uh, that, that we will be presenting. Then uh, we have Ferruccio Damiani, uh, Luca Paolini and Giordano Scarso, who are in uh, Turin at the moment. So they're uh, all from the MOVER research group, and uh, uh, two are associate professors, uh, working on software product lines and other stuff. And uh, Giordano Scars is uh, currently uh, finishing his studies uh, at the same university and has been working on uh, a front end for, for, for the tooling that we will be presenting under our supervision. And he will uh, present uh, this front end uh, in a demo towards the end of the tutorial in the second part. And then, then there's Michael Lienhardt, who is right now in France, I guess. Um, and uh, he works for the French space lab Onero. And uh, he, he's been involved in a specific part of this, uh, of this work. And he does uh, work also on uh, software product line engineering, software engineering in general, and static analysis. And of course, also on aerodynamics and things that are specific to the space lab. Okay, so um, otherwise they can personally say something more also in the chat. So we have two parts of this tutorial, one before the break, approximately one and a half hours. And then we have a half, hour, half an hour break. And then we have another half, one and a half hours. So in the first part, I will give some background on behavioral availability modeling and analysis for those that are less familiar with this. So that will basically focus on the difference between product and family-based analysis, um, feature transition systems as the computational model, which are built on uh, label transition systems, et cetera, et cetera. And I will explain uh, what we consider behavioral ambiguities. So that and false optional transitions and hidden deadlocks. And these kind of mirror the ambiguities that are common in feature modeling for with, with, with which maybe uh, some of the audience is more um, familiar. And then there will be a part on efficient or automated, efficient and automated uh, static analysis of feature transition systems. So that uh, concerns detecting the ambiguities. Uh, so how to define the criteria for these ambiguities, how to apply set solving to actually uh, do this. And uh, so this implementation will be uh, explained in, uh, in detail. And then we will show how this, uh, um, this, ambiguity, this ambiguating of uh, FTS actually works. So on some more examples and some benchmarks experiments that we performed. Um, throughout the tutorial, there will be some references to the literature, but uh, I, we will also be sharing this, um, this, this uh, slides. It's one big pack of slides that we will all be using and uh, we, will, we will distribute this. Uh, we're happy to distribute this for those interested. Um, so then there will be a second part after the break, and then we will change uh, uh, modeling formalism and we will go to model transition systems with specific variability constraints. We will explain uh, the principles of model checking and some temporal logics. And then uh, we'll go to the demo part where we'll first explain this uh, variability model checker model, uh, model checker developed uh, here in, uh, in, uh, in PISA. Uh, which can do some family-based model checking of uh, these model transition systems with variability constraints, actually also without. And uh, so we will show how this, how this work, how come that we can apply these results. And uh, we will show another demo of this uh, FTS for, for VMC, let's say. So this is a front end that together makes a tool chain, uh, which we will actually be presenting in the, in the tool demo track of uh, SPLC tomorrow mm -hmm. afternoon. 
and uh, there will be a demo of how this works and what it adds to, to WMC. Basically, it uh, allows to, to apply the, the family-based model checking techniques of uh, uh, WMC also um, to FTSs, okay? Okay, so let's start with behavioral uh, variability modeling and analysis. So background, uh, well, as you know, uh, this is just an introduction to your software product line. So configurable systems uh, are systems whose variants differ by specific features. So that's a piece of functionality that somehow can be uh, distinguished either by an end user or by a stakeholder, et cetera. And uh, well, these are everywhere. For example, when you're going to buy your next uh, BMW, you can, uh, you can do this actually online. You can configure your vehicle. You see here that, uh, do you actually see my mouse moving? I hope so. So uh, you see that uh, there's like 30 vehicles with 465 model variants. So this, this huge number comes uh, because you can you know, choose the coloring and the type of tires and everything, even if the, the basics of the vehicle, the core uh, assets, the core features are still the same. Well, this, uh, you, you find this also when you, you buy your next uh, computer or whatever, you can configure it to your, uh, to your liking, your cell phone. Right, so this is uh, what the software product lines are about. Usually there's some kind of reference architecture, a variability model. Here's a very simple uh, feature model. Uh, we see a root feature F and we see two child features F1 and F2. Um, in, the, in the picture on the left, okay, we see this uh, specific notation uh, which stands for alternative features. So F1 and F2 would be alternative here. And then we have so-called that that um, we have so-called so um, cross-t constraints. So there's an example of a cross-t constraint here, which uh, is um, the requires um, score, sorry the excludes relation. So what does it mean? It means that uh, f1 and f and f2 these two features they exclude each other. So if one is present, the other is not, and vice versa. Okay. But then we also have this notation. We see that f1 is a mandatory feature that's indicated by this uh, by this uh, bullet. And we have this open bullet which indicates that F2 is an optional feature. So if we put all these constraints together, we have a, a root feature, we have a child feature F1 that's mandatory. Okay, and then we have a feature F2, which is optional. And then we have an excludes relation between these two features. So if one is uh, mandatory, meaning that it's always present in any uh, product, then F2 cannot be uh, present due to this uh, excludes constraint. So actually this feature, uh, is a dead feature, or this is easy to see in such a small um, feature model. But if you imagine a, a, a big feature model, which, which typically in industry, there will be hundreds of features or thousands even, and then it's not so easy to see. So you see this feature, you see it's optional, you think it's, uh, uh, it, there are some products where it's present, actually it's dead. So that feature is a feature that is not present in any valid product of the product line, okay? And there's uh, a whole bunch of uh, work that's been done on the automated analysis of feature models. So trying to figure, to, to pinpoint these kind of dead features and uh, other uh, anomalies. And uh, well, this is a reference to the literature. Uh, here's another example, uh, false optional feature. So we see that F2 is, a, is an optional feature. So you have the idea that there may be some product, there must be some products where it's present and somewhere it's not present. But then if you look better again at this uh, feature model, now we have a requires relationship between the two features. Then this feature model is such that F1 is mandatory. Moreover, it requires F2. So what does it mean? It means that any valid product has both F1 and F2. So uh, in other words, this feature F2 is a false optional feature. It seems to be optional, but actually it's present in any uh, valid product, okay? So these are anomalies of uh, feature models. And what we are doing uh, in, with our tooling and in the, presenting in this uh, tutorial, is a means to find such uh, that uh, equivalence of dead features and, and false optional features in a behavioral context. So in behavioral models and specifically in uh, feature transition systems. And um, well, the, 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 why uh, look at the behavioral models? Well, because the software product lines are popular in, in embedded systems, in critical systems domain, and uh, formal modeling and analysis techniques to, to demonstrate that uh, software product line behavior is correct are widely studied. There's another reference to the literature. And uh, well, um, you see this is by one of the keynote speakers of this conference, while the reference here is uh, by the chair of the steering committee of, software, of uh, SPLC. So well-known well researchers in the field. 
So this, uh, this behavioral correctness uh, challenges what we know from formal methods and tools, uh, because we have a very high number, at least potentially, of different variants uh, given a configurable system. Moreover, each of these variants can by itself be a large, uh, so the system can be huge, the variants can be large uh, in, sense of, in the sense of their state space, so their behavior, their possible behavior. And then we have also many variants. So that means uh, we have a, a scalability issue in two directions, right? So scalability, as I said, is an issue. Uh, here's uh, one of my favorite slides from Christian Kessner, another main player in the software prototype field, who's now in Pittsburgh. So if we have th just 33 optional independent features, so that means that uh, we have two to the, thir to the uh, 33 um, valid products, then we have a unique uh, variant or product or configuration for every person on this planet. So this grows very, very uh, quickly. Of course, usually you do have uh, cross, cross tree constraints and other relations that uh, severely limit uh, the number of valid products even for 33 features. But just to give you an idea of how quickly exponentially uh, the state space explodes. Another great slide from uh, Christian, with 320 optional features, we have more configurations than estimated atoms in the universe. So this gives you an idea of the, of the scale. So what's, the, what's, what's one of the things that I work on and, and many of my colleagues presenting this tutorial that is uh, to lift uh, what we know how to do in, in formal methods or other uh, fields, so success stories for single systems. So for we know how to do this for a system, for a product, for a variant, and how to lift this to the field of product lines. So at certain, at, 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 um, what does it mean? It means that you have to apply your technique suddenly not to just one product or one system, but to a whole bunch of them, which are interconnected. I mean, they have a lot of commonalities and some differences. So you want to exploit the variability in this uh, configurable systems to apply uh, the techniques or the, or the, let's say verification or testing or whatever uh, analysis technique uh, or modeling technique that you have to such systems, okay? And uh, well, the analysis techniques in particular for correctness, let's say, or for quality uh, control, uh, we will here consider two uh, basic uh, techniques. One is called product-based analysis or brute force. It's a simple, uh, very simple approach. And you use the standardly available, very much optimized analysis tools or testing techniques or model checking tools. And um, well, this is, uh, is it, that's the good part of it. The bad part is that, the, the, as I said, showed before on the scalability slide, the number of uh, variants that we have to deal with, it's exponential in the number of features. So if you have to verify every product one by one, you may run into serious problems of time. Uh, and there, that's, that's a, you know, a concrete problem. And also, uh, let's say philosophically, there's a problem because there's a piece of the behavior or of, or of the code that's being verified numerous times, as many times as it, is, as it occurs in the variance, right? So all the core, the core code or the core behavior, it's, it's verified as, as many times as the number of variants that, uh, that has that part, right? So it goes against the principles of, uh, of efficiency in, uh, in product line engineering. So we see here uh, another nice uh, figure from, uh, from Sven Apple. Um, so SQL Lite, which is one of these this, this product lines, it has 88 features. And if we were to uh, analyze this product by product, then, uh, well, here's Leicester, right? This is the famous symbol of Leicester. We are, on, we are online now, but the symbol of the University of Leicester. So then we would, uh, you know, we are here now, then we would not finish until, well, until we are, the, the earth is occupied by aliens, let's say. So this would take too long, way too long, unfeasible, absolutely unfeasible. Uh, so the solution is family-based analysis. One of the solutions, there are others, but what we consider here as a, as a viable solution is family-based analysis. And when is this beneficial? Well, if you have many products which have a lot of similarities, so they have many core features uh, that are the same, okay? Um, and uh, in that case, the same piece of behavior is verified only once, independently of how many variants uh, can actually produce it, okay? Is anybody still listening? Because it's really strange not to have any feedback. Yes, yes. Okay, good. it's good. I, otherwise, just think of a question once in a while, then I know that you're still there. Uh, you know, my internet connection sometimes goes down, so it's really good to, to hear somebody's actually listening. Okay, so uh, what's the, um, the negative side of family-based analysis? Well, it requires a much more complex analysis task, so research to do, which is not by, by itself negative, of course, but I mean, there's work to do. And it requires uh, compact, as 
compact as possible uh, family models. And these are also called uh, 150% models in, 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 in the field, right? So what has been uh, developed then over the years is dedicated variab variability-based models, logics, model checkers, testing techniques. I don't work in testing, but there's a lot of work there also. So examples of, uh, of, of, of the formal methods, part of formal methods where I work is like uh, the, the feature transition systems, of course, but also Petrinets have been extended with features. Uh, CCS, which is a well-known process algebra, um, uh, has been extended with a product line variant, so product line CCS. Uh, feature-based LTL logics, feature-based uh, CTL logics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Many, many um, techniques, tools, logics, etc. However, there is a downside also to this because every dedicated new model checker or tool that you that you develop has, will have to be maintained and optimized for the specific use, right? So uh, there has been also a lot of work on uh, trying to apply existing. Uh, model checkers in, in my case, or existing techniques and tooling, um, somehow using, uh, you know, using like uh, lifting techniques to, to the family level without having, so without uh, changing the tooling. So uh, there's a number of papers, uh, for example, at FACE that have for many years have been published on this, uh, on this field. So to do family-based model checking without actually a novel uh, model checker, but simply do some extraction techniques or lifting and be able to use the, the model checkers that are already out there and that are already being maintained and optimized. So this is basically a similar thing to what we are doing with, uh, with this uh, variability model checker that we developed here. It has a, the, the engine and everything is, uh, has been optimized for years in, uh, in other, uh, for other uh, purposes. So now the key idea and aim um, of, of underlying this tutorial, let's say, and underlying some papers that we published over the last years in uh, SPLC, including the, the tool paper of tomorrow. So uh, we want to, as I said, mimic this anomaly detection known from feature model analysis to behavioral uh, software product line models, FTSs in particular, in an automated way, of course, and we do this by static analysis. So what do we want to find in feature transition systems? We want to find dead transitions if they are there and signal them to the, to the, to the modeler false optional transitions and hidden deadlock states. Uh, so the first two, I already showed you the equivalent in the feature model uh, world and the hidden deadlock states have a kind of different uh, motivation, uh, which I will uh, explain shortly. So why do we want to do this, uh, catch these, uh, these anomalies? Uh, well, first of all, because uh, what we call ambiguous feature transition systems, so that those are feature transition systems that have either of these uh, kind of transitions or states. They are typically undesired. They provide some unclear idea of the software product line. Some may be intentional, but not always. So we want to signal them to, uh, to the developer and then the developer, he or she can decide whether this was intentional or not. Moreover, and that's what uh, the nice thing that, uh, that we found out and that we've then been uh, exploiting is that such an unambiguous FTS, so if, if we uh, un disambiguate an FTS, so we remove that transitions and things like that, this paves the way to a very efficient kind of family-based verification with the tooling, existing tooling that we already had. So it comes kind of comes for free. So this is what we will be explaining in the in the in the, in the rest of this uh, tutorial. Okay, so I've been mentioning now several times uh, feature transition systems. So let's go into some more detail and let's see what these feature transition systems are. So this is where we... still hearing? Yeah. Hi, Leopoldo. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> I actually have my camera on, on sorry, but uh, I have the, we have no childcare today. So oh, don't, have... don't, don't worry. You have a question. All kids around. Uh, yeah, I, I, you had, uh, I mean, that, that's uh, maybe a quick question, but uh, you grab the, the anomalies from the feature model uh, side to, to the, let's say, the, the problem of model checking also have the hidden deadlock state, which you, you will uh, uh, later present. But uh, are there more uh, of these kinds of anomalies or ambiguities that could be uh, uh, kind of lifted from the typical problems that in, in model checking uh, you would have for a single product, but for the context of variability? I mean, of course, there, there, there's always some another uh, 
checking or detection that you can perform, but I was just uh, curious whether you have already ex uh, have plans to expand with further uh, detection techniques or ambiguities. That's no, so this it's a very good, very good question. Um, we, we we have been we have been uh, thinking about this, also triggered by a, a reviewer at a certain point. But um, so let's say the most classical. Uh, so two parts of of the of your question. So the most classical operations that are performed on feature models, we didn't see any other ones that that uh, would have an immediate equivalent in the behavioral models. And uh, the second question, whether we see any other uh, ambiguities that maybe do not have an equivalent <coughs> in the in the feature modeling world, uh, we've we've been trying to think of something, but we we did not actually uh, come up with anything that we thought uh, worthy enough of uh, of investigating. So my answer would be no, but we are very much open to suggestions if you if you if you do. Yeah, yeah, I think of something. I wasn't the reviewer, by the way. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> But uh, yeah, one thing that uh, I mean, it's not the scope of the tutorial, but also uh, I think some operations on feature models that this, this wouldn't be ambiguity. But uh, when you consider evolution, there might be some uh, aspects from the feature model side, such as operations like adding a feature, removing a feature, changing the feature system, things like that might be beneficial for uh, going uh, that, Yeah, that, that is over time, not only yeah. over uh, the. the the variability aspect for, for a simple snapshot. But that, that's probably outside of the scope, but uh, I would be interested in learning yeah, more that, that offline. That, <laughs> That I that I that I agree on, and that I can imagine. And and uh, yeah, as you said, it's it's a little bit outside uh, of the scope of what we're doing. But if you're talking about evolution, uh, then then uh, then I think there are there are counterparts. Yes, Mohammed, I think you raised your hand. Yeah, so I, I was wondering, I was thinking about Leopoldo's question, and I was trying to think of other types of properties could be that could be interesting. So you you looked at ambiguity, but you may also look at under specification. Suppose you look at your FDS and you find out that two features are completely um, uh, exclusive to each other, but this hasn't been captured by the by the feature model. The feature model considers them to be uh, both optional. But ah, if you look at the behavior, good. then there yeah, are yeah, there. that's a, that's a good point. So you mean learning from behavior model, kind of. So learning for the feature model from the behavioral model. Yeah. So finding under specification the feature model, indeed, in in the in the behavioral model. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that that that. Uh, yeah. I I I really didn't think of this, but the, I think that 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 that's interesting. That should be possible. Yeah. I mean, I'm uh, so I'm certain that cert such cases would exist. I just don't right now uh, know how how you can actually catch them right but uh, i'm i'm sure this can uh, this this must exist and... i think that could also further help you to uh, structure the feature training system in in nicer structures or more compositional structures in the future yes yeah, sure sure this may be i mean these kind of uh, are, are obvious separation uh, for compositional uh, yeah I, I i i can see that yeah that's a good point i have to i have to write that down one of my co-presenters, please write write this down for future research. This is this is very interesting. Okay, so um, yeah, okay. So so for for here we have these uh, three of which two really come from this feature model world and this hidden deadlocks. So why I will explain you very shortly. I have some kind of other. Okay, we are still recording. I can continue then. I think. Okay, so label so label transition systems are at the basis of the of the computational models we will see in this in this talk in this tutorial. So label transition is a quadruple. So we have four sets here. Uh, there's an example here. Let me explain you uh, one by one for those less familiar with them, right? So I mean, for Mohammed and some others, this is really basic stuff. But we have a set of states. So one in this uh, figure, you can see one, two, three until nine, nine states. Uh, we have an alphabet uh, of actions. We have a set of actions, events. Uh, in this case, pay, change, open, take, close. This is a this is a simple vending machine, right? So this, uh, I will show you the behavior shortly. First, let's see the four components. Uh, we have an initial stage, which in this case is one, indicated by this wiggly arrow, and we have a transition relation. So we have transitions. We can go from state one to state two by the action pay, from state two to state three by the action change. Okay, so this would be modeling a user that uh, you know wants to pay, actually pays uh, for a drink, gets some change, and then uh, this user either chooses a soda or a tea, right? You see that there's some uh, 
a choice here. And then, uh, well, if, if, if he or she has chosen soda, we'll be served soda. Then this uh, compartment actually opens, you know, just like vending machines with this compartment. You pick your drink, take your drink, and then this compartment closes again, and it's ready for the same or another user to, to get a drink. And maybe the next time around, you'll take a tea, he or she. Okay, so that's basically a very simple behavior of a very simple vending machine. Uh, and, well, we have these four elements, states, actions, or events, an initial state with where, it's, where it all starts, and the transitions, okay? And uh, we can have more labeling on these uh, transition systems and so-called doubly labeled transition systems, which I'm presenting because they are the underlying mechanism of our tooling. Um, so then we would have, uh, in additionally, to, to what we have seen on the, on the previous slide, we would have a set of uh, atomic propositions. And in this case, um, uh, they are, ah, they're in the wrong uh, color. Paid, ready, served, and uh, taken. That would be these atomic propositions that are uh, label, labels on states. Okay, so we see here in, in, the, in the labeling function, we see that the state two is labeled with the atomic proposition paid, and the state three is labeled with the atomic proposition ready. Okay, so these are typically can be uh, sets of atomic propositions. In this talk, in this tutorial, there will always be singleton elements, and we, om we, we omit, or omit the set notation for singleton elements here. Okay, and another uh, well-known structure in model checking is, for example, a Kripke structure, which is like such a, a transition system, but then we only have the state labeling and not the transition labeling, not the actions. Okay, so these, let's just remember for now this label transition system. If we add to a label transition system a feature model and uh, what we call feature expressions, then we get a, for, a featured transition system. This is one of the most uh, well-known behavioral models in the software product line world. And they were originally introduced by Andreas Klassen and uh, many others, Excel, Legay, et cetera, in, uh, in the, their ICSI 2010 paper. This paper was uh, given the MIP award at SPLC last year. Okay, so very influential paper. And uh, so what do we have then? We have a feature model, as you can see here, of a vending machine. So this feature model has uh, beverages, and uh, we have this or relation, tea, uh, soda or tea or both. And we have two optional features, either free drinks or cancel a pur uh, your purchase. So you can cancel, you start paying, and then actually you change your mind. You don't want to drink at all. Okay, so we see here uh, um, such a feature transition system. I will show you later how exactly this works. But basically, we have the same uh, uh, similar initial state, let's say. And we have, for example, the possibility to pay and go to the state two. But this is conditioned by the... Uh, absence of the feature F. What is this feature F? This was the free drinks, right? So if you have a free drinks feature active, then you don't pay. And in fact, we see that there's a possibility to go from state one to state three by an action free in the presence of the feature F, which is the free drinks feature, okay? So this is basically how we have to uh, look at this feature transition system. Uh, more formally, uh, we have six elements here. So we have again states, uh, we have again actions, events, we have an initial state, and we have a transition relation, which is at this point slightly different. I've just explained you how it works, how you have to read. So we have an action, then we have a bar, and then we have the feature uh, expression, which is a, a Boolean expression over features. Okay, so uh, here they are all of a very simple form, but it could also be, uh, for example, S and not T. So you could require the presence of one feature and, and the absence of another. Okay, they can be Boolean compositions. Then we have a set of features in this case, which are of course these elements which you can compose into, into these Boolean compositions of features. So in this case, we have uh, the ones that actually labeled the, the feature model, right? You see the shorthand notations, V, B, B F, C, S, T, etc. Okay. And then we have uh, this big lambda, which is the set of product configurations, okay? And uh, here are two examples. So we could pick this set of uh, features or this set of features. This is conditioned by the feature model, okay? This has to satisfy the feature model. And uh, then we have a means to project on this feature transition system. So given a specific configuration, so one of these sets, a uh, valid set of configurations, we actually obtain a product, okay? I will show you now how this is, but basically what you do is you remove all the uh, transitions whose feature expression are not satisfied by the specific configuration. And then in the end, you remove anything that's not reachable. So let's look at this in concrete. So we have this feature model. 
which models 12 uh, valid products. Two of them are those that I already showed you. Why, why is this, for example, let's have a look at the first one, okay? So the vending machine root is always present. We have the B from the beverages, which is an obligatory mandatory feature, uh, this B. And then uh, we have S and T. And that's okay because these are in an or relation. So I can pick uh, either of the two or also both. So this would be a feature, uh, this would be a product which has uh, which serves uh, soda and tea, but it does not have the, neither the free drinks uh, feature nor the cancel purchase feature. So let's look at this. This is the FTS we've seen before of all valid products. If we look only at this valid product, okay, one of them, then we actually project, as I said before. So we project on those uh, transitions that are valid according to this uh, feature model. So we have a V, we have B, we have S, and we have T. Okay, so we don't have F. So if I uh, see, for example, this action three going from one to three, okay, so you can go from state one to state three by an action three if you have the feature F. We see that in this first uh, example, there's no F. In fact, this transition has been uh, removed, okay? So if we do this, we project on the specific feature configuration, we get an LTS, okay? This is a simple label transition system that we saw in the beginning. You just have uh, states and actions between the states that take you from one state to another. Uh, this is the other example. Here we only have soda uh, chosen. So this is a machine that only serves soda, but you can uh, cancel. You can change your mind, you, you pay, you get your change, but then you change your mind and you get everything back, okay? And you can start again or another user can use the machine. Okay, so far so good. Everyone still there? Yes. yes. Great. Yes. Okay, so let's go to the ambiguities then in these models. Okay, so now we're here in our, in our uh, table of contents. So now I will show you what are dead false optional transitions in a feature transition system and what are hidden deadlocks. So a dead transition, Okay, it's a transition in a feature transition system, which is not reachable in any product. So that's really the counterpart of a dead feature in a feature model, right? So you see this transition, you think it's part of some behavior. So in some product LTS, you expect to see it, but in the end, it's never there. Okay, so this transition is a dead transition. You could just as well remove it. A false optional transition, it's another <coughs> perfect counterpart of the idea of a feature model, false optional in a feature model. So it's a transition of an FTS, feature transition. So it means it actually has some kind of feature condition after the bar. It's not dead. It's not annotated with this feature expression true. This is the symbol for true. Okay, so which means it's always selected. And it is actually present in every product, okay, where its source state is reachable, is present. Okay, so why is this a false optional transition? Well, it is because if you look at the FTS, you see an action bar and you see con a feature expression, a condition, you say, okay, in this specific condition, if this is valid in these configurations, this transition is there. But then in the end, uh, you see that it's actually always there whenever the source state, of course, is present. Okay, so that's the perfect counterpart again of what we've seen feature modeling. And then we have what we call a hidden deadlock state. And so deadlock states are important because it, uh, so if you have a deadlock, there's no progress, right? And there's a lot of properties in, in the verification that hold when we have a guaranteed progress or, or so-called liveness. We also call this liveness. And that's what we, a, a property that we will really use in this tutorial for our tooling. Okay, so let's go to the definition. So this hidden deadlock state of a feature transition system, it's such that it's not a deadlock in the feature transition system. So not being a deadlock means it has outgoing transitions. So it's a state from which you can continue, okay? But it is a deadlock, so no outgoing transitions. You cannot, you get stuck there in some uh, feature transition system products. So we call this a hidden deadlock because in the FTS, it doesn't appear to be a deadlock, but if you go and project on the product level, it's actually a deadlock, okay? Uh, these are the, are the definitions. So then uh, we can immediately see, I already actually anticipated this when I explained, uh, the, the, gave the definition. We can go from an ambiguous, we call it ambiguous, but it's maybe not the right word, but from an ambiguous FTS to an unambiguous FTS. So an ambiguous FTS is defined as an FTS which has either a dead transition or a false optional transition or a hidden dead look. Okay, and an ambiguous one is, is one that doesn't have any of these. So the transformation concerning dead transitions, very easy. You simply remove them. 
You can do this because they're not part of any product. I see there's a message in the chat. Does it concern me? Should I open it? No, it's just uh, Muhammad who said that he has to leave now. Okay, great. See you, see you later, Mohammed. One of these days. Um, so the debt transitions, we simply remove. The false optional transitions, we simply turn them into must transitions. Remember, a false optional transition is a transition that seems to be you know, conditioned by the feature expression, but in the end, it's present in all products. So actually, you can just as well say it's a must transition. It has to be there always. So we can simply re replace the, the featured expression that is there behind the bar with the symbol true. Okay, so that makes it more clear. If you see the FTS immediately, you see the symbol, you know, okay, that transition is always there in any product. And that may be, uh, you know, good to see this. And then the hidden deadlock states, we simply make them explicit. Uh, Maurice, there is a question in the chat. Okay, great. Let me look at the chat. In a sense, hidden deadlock is analogous to type checking product, where it's false if some product has typing uh, issues. Uh, well, I, I, okay, so I don't know if it's really analogous. I, I, I understand your point, but I don't think it's, I don't know if it's really not analogous, but um, is it really a typing issue? Uh, uh, yeah. I can open the mic, sorry. No, I meant in the sense of the, the reasoning, not the, the reasoning in the sense of if some product has typing issues, then it's uh, so it, Yeah, okay, okay, okay. It, yeah, it's that law, so you consider that uh, uh, so it's not it's not necessary that all products have uh, uh, that law. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. In in that in that the essential has variability that could be in the, as you mentioned uh, uh, hidden. Uh, in some of the products, you might have that law. It could be the case that you're not even executing such products or using now, but. Uh, eventually, if you select or configure such a product, then you would have a problem. Exactly, exactly. Okay, in, the, in that sense, yes. And in fact, we, we don't really want to, so we don't want to remove the deadlocks. We simply want to make them explicit at the family level. So in that sense, uh, you're, you're right. So what we do then to make these hidden deadlock states explicit is to add a deadlock state right to the, to the, to, to the family level, to the family model at the FTS. We add a deadlock state, a new state with this dagger symbol, and we add a, a specific deadlock transition from, uh, from this uh, hidden deadlock state to this new state, which is labeled, um, uh, let's say, with the disjunction, so it, with a feature expression that negates the disjunction of the feature expressions of the outgoing transitions. This sounds complicated, and that's why the next slide contains an example. Okay. Um, just a quick question about this. So are these properties, um, all of them, global or local so for example the deadlock state is it something where you just need to look at the state and it's um outgoing transitions or is do you need to see it in a more global way where you need to see well um is this state even reachable when it is a deadlock okay so um so it, it is uh Local in the sense that you only need to look at the state, but you need to look at the feature expression of the outgoing transitions to be able to know uh, whether this is a, a deadlock in the products. Okay, so you can okay. see it that you can see it at the family level, but you have to uh, look at the at the feature expressions. This is an important part of the uh, uh, of the next part we will presenting when we when we will um, present the static analysis. We will. Uh, do some SAT solving, and this is an important criteria to to model. So okay, because I mean, it could be even <clears throat> worse, where you have to look at the whole at the the family, um, but then also at the whole transition system to see, for example, if uh, the state is only a deadlock state in configurations where it's not reachable, um, then ignore it, or because the deadlock is only a a bad thing, maybe if it's reachable or Yes, yes. Okay. And and you have to look like globally at the family level and at the whole transition system level. Yeah, so you can you can look only at the family level, but okay. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. since the since the family level through these feature expressions codifies all the products, you actually have the full view, but you don't have to generate them. Yeah, okay. I mean the products. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. But uh, as we see now in the example, so the easiest for me to explain, so so to, to answer your question maybe even better, I hope. So the, on the top here, you see, let's look only at the first 
uh, feature transition system, the one on the top left, this one that I'm sure, uh, indicating now. Okay, so I can see false optional data only looking at this, but it's much easier uh, to actually, uh, to for, for explaining it to you, it's much easier if I simply generate the two products and then we can uh, easily see what happens, but it suffices to look at the family at the FTS. So we have here a feature model associated with any FTS, right? We have, so this, this FTS has a starting state S0. It has a loop on A if the feature F2 is present. It can go with another A with the same A to state S1 if the feature F1 is present. From S1, it can go with an action A to S2 if F1 is present. And there it can loop on A if F2 is present. But we have a feature model. Any, any feature transition system has a feature model associated. And this feature model, uh, this is the symbol for the XOR. So F1 and F2 are alternative, exclusive OR, okay? So we can have either F1 or F2, but not both. Okay, so if we take that into consideration, then we have uh, two valid products here. One uh, called lambda one is the one which has only feature F1, and the other one called lambda two, the configuration lambda two, it has only the feature F2. We see these two products uh, drawn here. This is the first one projecting on lambda one, we get this transition system. What does this projection mean? It means that I only have F1. So any uh, transition where there is required a label, um, a feature F2, I remove them. Okay, so you see that this loop has been removed from S0. This other loop has been removed from S2. While the two transitions that uh, link S0, S1 and S2 to each other, they have as label F1. So they are present actually in this product. Likewise, I have the other uh, product, which is uh, lambda two. And I have the initial state. I maintain this loop because it requires the presence of F2, but then uh, that's it, right? I cannot go to state S1 because it requires the presence of feature F1. And if I have the, uh, this loop, that means I have the feature F2, so I don't have F1. So these are the only two um, interesting products here, okay? And, um, that, that would that would also be uh, the, the the one without any features. So let let's look at these two products, okay? And then I can see that um, the the transition, the loop on on S two, okay, this loop here, it's a dead transition, okay? Because we see that this transition uh, a transition looping on S two. It's not present in this in this one because not even the state is present, but it's also not present in this product, the left one, because you see the loop is not there. So this is a dead transition. It's not present in any product. We can just as well remove it. If we remove this, we get the same two products, okay? Uh, then let's look at this transition, A uh, labeled with F1, okay? So if I am in state S1 at the family level, so the only way to get to the state S1 is to perform this action A, which, can, which I can do if I have the feature F1, okay? So only looking at the feature transition system, I see that if I'm in state F1, I have the feature F1. Otherwise I could not have got, gotten there. If I have the feature F1, I look at the feature model, I don't have the feature F2. So this transition will always be present because I've just said I have the feature F1. So I can always go to this state S2. And indeed the next one is not. So as we see in this, uh, in this first product here on the left, we see that we have these two actions, A, one following the other, and we can get to state S2. So what does it mean? This, this, this transition here at the family level, it looks optional, right? It looks like I can go to state from state S1 to S2 uh, with an action A if, if feature one is present. But it's a false optional because in, in any product where S1 is present, this transition is there. Okay, so what I mean, what we mean here is that I, if I replace this feature F1 with the symbol true, the behavior, the, the products are all the same, okay? So in that sense, we consider it a false optional transition. Then the, 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 dead, the hidden deadlock state. Okay, so look at, again at the feature transition system. I have three states and I always see progress, right? In, in state S0, I can move. In state S1, I can move. And in state S2, there's this loop, I can move. Okay, so looking at the feature transition system of the family, this one, I think there's progress. There's always progress and there's no deadlock. If I look at the products, it's not quite the situation because, okay, this one is not, does not have a deadlock. It simply loops on uh, S0. 
But this first product, it goes from state S0 to S1, from S1 to S2, and then there's a deadlock, okay? So there's a deadlock in this product in state S2. And I don't see this immediately in my feature transition system here. So we would like to make this more explicit. So ignore still the other example. Uh, to remedy this, uh, make this uh, feature transition system F um, unambiguous, what I do is I remove the dead transition, which is the loop on A. I change this false optional transition A labeled with F1 in A labeled with true. Okay, and then, um, then I have nothing else to do because what has happened after I moved, removed this dead transition, okay, this state S2 has become a deadlock state in the uh, feature transition system, okay? So now actually it's no longer a hidden deadlock state, it's explicit. I see right by looking at this feature transition system, I see that there is an S2, a state S2, which is a deadlock. It's a deadlock in the feature transition system, so it will be a deadlock also um, in the in the pro in one of the products, or at least it cannot be a surprise. Okay. Now, if I look at this small uh, small change, uh, this feature transition system F prime, okay, on the on the right, yeah, then it has changed a little bit. I have a little bit different products, but most interesting here, what what I wanted to show is this uh, is this uh, specific state S one, right? This is a, a hidden deadlock state and, and why? So the two products that I get here, the one is still the same, this product on the left, okay? Which still brings me with two actions, A into state S2. Why? Because the first is always there, this transition, you see it's true. So I can always go from S0 to S1. And if I have the feature F1, I can also go from S1 to S2. So this is clearly a valid product. <clears throat> the second product has changed. Because in state S0, I now have the feature F2. So I have this loop, as we see here. And I also have the possibility to go from uh, S1, S0 to S1 by action A, end up in S1. When I am in state S1, remember, this is the product where I have only the feature F2, then I cannot continue to state S2 because I don't have the feature F1. Because if I have F2, F1 is not there. So this is the product. Uh, that belongs to the configuration of only F2, okay? And we see that this state S1, it's a deadlock in this product. While in the feature transition system here, S1 is not a deadlock state. So this S1 is red because it's a hidden deadlock state, okay? So what do I do to make this FTS F prime unambiguous? It's the one here on the bottom right. What I do is I add an explicit uh, deadlock state as dagger, okay? And I go there with the negation of the disjunction of the outgoing transitions from S1. Well, in this case, it's easy. It has one outgoing transition, which is A uh, conditioned by F1. So here I go with dagger to this deadlock state, explicit deadlock state, with the negation of F1. The negation of F1 in a, in a feature model with only F1 and F2 is F2. So if I have F2, like in this uh, case, okay, then I see I have an explicit deadlock. OK, so at the feature transition system level, I have made this hidden deadlock. I've made it explicit by adding a new state. And this is an explicit deadlock. OK, so this is how we disambig disambiguate uh, FTSs. Is this clear? If anybody's still there? Yes. Yeah. OK, great. So I, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I, I finished my part. Um, uh, of this first. Okay. okay. Just five minutes late. Five minutes late. Well, that's that's because I was interrupted by Leopoldo. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So, uh, okay. So, sorry for being five minutes late. So, I will stop uh, sharing. I'm still here for questions concerning this part or also afterwards, of course. And, uh, well, if, if if Luca is ready, I will give uh, the floor yeah, to Luca. Yeah, I... I... I'm ready. Yeah, yeah you can. And uh, uh, I share my slide. Yeah. Okay. So. Do you see them? Yes, I do. Okay. Hi, I'm Luca Paolini, and uh, yes, I will follow the, the tutorial. Um, Maybe you can put the full screen. Yeah. 
maybe sometimes can be okay so this is only not full screen but okay um, it should be a view full screen presentation or something uh, sorry for okay now um <clears throat> well in the first part in the first section, uh, Maurice has introduced the feature transition systems, feature transition systems on which we can uh, uh, check the behavioral properties of a software product line. In particular, uh, for uh, we have a rejection between uh, products of the software product line and uh, the label transition system that are collected in our feature transition system. Uh, what we are doing, we want to do is uh, uh, to um, identify the what we call it ambiguities in our feature transition system, uh, and in particular, dead transition, false option and transition, and hidden dead dog states. Uh, why? Maurice has already said that, but why we want to to um, to identify these ambiguities, since they, uh, in, can, in some sense, uh, should be notified to the designer of the software product line, since uh, are really ambiguity in, in the design, and on the other end, since uh, their elimination, uh, as Maurice as uh, as uh, just say, uh, allow to successfully and fully use. Uh, uh, some model checker as VMC. Uh, in uh, this part of the talk, I will speak about the ambiguity detection uh, in a family base based uh, approach. Um, indeed, to check the, the ambiguities, to, to identify the ambiguities in a single product is a uh, not too hard. Uh, work that can be automatized uh, quite easy. But as I say by Maurice, the brute force approach uh, is too expensive in concrete cases. So uh, in particular, uh, since uh, SPL and FTS have uh, many commonalities, what we want to do is uh, to leverage these commonalities and uh, analyze the whole product uh, at once bringing um, bringing down the total time uh, that we need for our analysis to uh, reach is uh, to face this goal what uh, we 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 propose is to use a sub tool uh, i just recall that uh, the SAT problem, the satisfiability problem is just the problem uh, of taking an input uh, of considering a formula, a Boolean formula, a propositional logical formula, and uh, to, uh, to look for uh, an assignment of threat values to each uh, atomic variable in our formula that make uh, our formula true in accord to the fact table uh, that uh, uh, are associated to the connectives in our formula. So typically connective are uh, implications, uh, conjunction, disjunction, and so on. So a, a quite standard and uh, problem. Such solver indeed are program that take an input this kind of formula or propositional formula and return true if and only if the formula is satisfiable or false if and only if the formula is not satisfiable. Sometimes that solver uh, give back some more information as a, 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 a witnessing uh, uh, assignment uh, in, the, in the positive case, in the case in which the formula is really satisfiable. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, 
we use a Z3 in, uh, in, uh, in experiment and uh, in our implementation. But uh, we will say, I will say something more uh, after about it. Um, such solving indeed is a, is an expensive task uh, since uh, uh, it become quickly impractable uh, and uh, uh, the complexity is exponential indeed is uh, empty complete because each time we have uh, a fart uh, uh, atomic proposition the number of possible interpretation double so uh, the, the complexity is uh, to rise it up uh, to n, where n is the number of uh, atomic variable in our form. Luckily, uh, in, uh, in software verification, we don't, uh, we, we, uh, we have to, to manage to, to consider formulas, Boolean formulas, which are in, in some sense not too hard. And uh, indeed, the use of a solver is uh, successfully used, used in practice. So uh, is uh, uh, the use of such solver to, to face this kind of problem uh, is uh, really promising. Uh, indeed, such solver are used for a lot of application uh, that span from uh, sort of verification, as you just said, to uh, artificial intelligence, algorithm, hardware design, and so on. And from the 2002, uh, the, there is a, an international sub competition uh, that uh, evaluates uh, the progress and the state of the art of such solver and award the best uh, such tool uh, available uh, submitted to, 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 to the competition. Uh, indeed, uh, today, most such solver are still uh, based on uh, some old idea uh, related to the um, that uh, was proposed by Davis Putman and Davis Logeman uh, Loveland, but uh, adding sharp heuristic stochastic uh, approaches and so on, also really quantum approaches, but this is really uh, a, a research uh, line. Um, in order to, to use a such solver for, to, to face the family, uh, a fam to, to, to propose a family based um, ambiguity detection, we have first uh, choose a convenient uh, data representation of our feature transition system. Uh, we included in the FTS uh, structure, programming structure, uh, a field for states where to store state of the feature transition system that we want to check, uh, as, um, a field of transitions where to store all transition, a field initial where to store the initial state, and a field FN where to store the Boolean formula B on uh, features that uh, give us the information of the feature diagram. Each state indeed contain also three fields, uh, ingoing transitions, the set of ingoing transition in the state that we are considering, the set of outgoing transition, of uh, uh, the state that we are considering, and a Boolean, uh, flag that uh, our algorithm will update uh, when uh, um, with the information uh, obtained by, by using the sub solver that will say as if the state under consideration is or not an uh, needed network. For transition, we have uh, considered a list Four fields. We have considered four fields in our, in our algorithm. Uh, Bx is uh, uh, the feature expression that label the transition that we are considering. And so is a propositional formula uh, on feature, as shown in example before, and we will see 
an example after, source stored source uh, state of the transition and then at the false false option false opt uh, are two uh, boolean variable two boolean field where uh, our algorithm will put the, the information about the fact that the transition under consideration is dead or is false option. Indeed, uh, we, we, we have uh, introduced also a set of name for, uh, for transition. Indeed, here we have a set of action in the formal definition of the transition system that uh, Maurice has uh, presented before. We have a set of action and a set of transition uh, that in some sense are a priority, but uh, here we, we, uh, we use a set of name for this, uh, for, for each one of these transitions uh, in order to can build to, um, a formula uh, where the propositional variable is formed by the union of uh, features uh, of uh, states, so the state of the future transition system and the name of uh, each transition. Indeed, we, uh, we will look for an interpretation for an assignment that map uh, each of these uh, uh, names in, uh, these, in this union uh, to true false here represented by top and bottom. Uh, <clears throat> so FTS states is uh, sometimes used for, for, uh, for the name of states. FTS transition is used sometimes for the name of transition and FTS initial uh, is used in the next slide sometimes for the uh, uh, initial state. We call it also in a state or state which are not initial. This is because we will uh, consider some initial path which is a, a simple path that starts from the initial uh, state and go until some, uh, some given state. Uh, to um, build uh, um, some, uh, some uh, propositional formula that can be supplied to our SAT solver, we uh, consider some uh, simple formula. The first one is phi initial, which is essentially the name of the initial state, which is the name of the initial state. It is the, the formula that is just an assignment of a track value uh, to, to absorb. It's just the formula uh, the, the formed by the name of the initial state. Then we considered um, Another formula, which is phi inner, which is this one, that ask us uh, that for all in a state, so all state which are not initial, uh, if the state is uh, selected, is uh, uh, assigned to, to, to true by our interpretation, then the implication of why this, uh, there is a at least one transition that enter the state. So there is a, a, at least one transition which is satisfied between the incoming transition in S. This is uh, just a placeholder that uh, suggests the, the, the semantical meaning of the statement, which is a placeholder for, for that piece of form. So for all transition, uh, in X, so between the incoming one, uh, the, the, the transition, uh, there is at least one transition here, such that the interpretation will make true the label of the transition, include the transition and include the source, the state, uh, from which the, the, the transition has origin. Then we, we have another formula which asks that for each uh, state, at most one uh, 
transition is hard to go. This is, uh, uh, can be brought explicitly in this way, but uh, uh, yes, is, uh, the semantic is clear. We ask that if for all T, if T is selected, all order transition in X, so in the outgoing transition from the state are not selected. And last, we have did a formula and that ask that the state S is selected together with uh, the fact that no transition is outgoing from it. So all outgoing transition from S, T are not selected. So this formula is, will be satisfied just uh, when S is assigned to true, to true and T, all T in this set are assigned to false. By using this four formula, uh, well, here we have a, a lemma that, for, that essentially uh, formalize what I have just said. By using this uh, four formula together to the future model, so the formula that identify all and only the valid product, the valid LTS of our feature transition system, we can build this formula that will uh, make us able to uh, encode twice like forwardly, forwardly uh, all, uh, um, all uh, um, ambiguity uh, program. Well, <clears throat> this formula is called is useful state, but essentially uh, it asks that for S, for a state S, the state S is reachable in at least this formula is satisfiable, will be satisfiable, is satisfiable, sorry, when there is a product, so a selection of a feature in the feature model that make true this part of the formula, uh, that also satisfy all the conjunction of all, all these part of formula. So S can be reached by a sequence starting from the initial state that uh, go in inner status and uh, uh, in a single way. So we have uh, essentially a simple path that uh, from the starting state uh, reach the, uh, the state S. So we have built here a formula which is satisfiable if and only if for state S is satisfiable if and only if there is at least, at least one LTS product. So a product of our future transition system, which is reachable uh, starting from the initial state and reaching the, 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 the considered state S. This is the formula that will allow, that allow has to uh, use as a solver uh, for, in order to check directly on the feature transition system, the ambiguities. Here, there is an example maybe uh, uh, quite, uh, quite simple, but uh, we have uh, this feature transition system uh, where, and we have that just one product, uh, which is true. So uh, all things are selected, but uh, the projection to the product just include this state. And indeed is, uh, is easy to check that is useful state of S, so of the state is uh, uh, false, is not reachable essentially, and the uh, useful state of S1 is also false, is not, is not satisfied in many uh, product, value product of our FPS. Uh, <clears throat> by using these 
this uh, formula, we can build three part of formula which essentially correspond to our ambiguity detection. The first one is just S is reachable and uh, no transition uh, going out from the state S is selected. So we have an interpretation that say we have maybe more than one interpretation, but no interpretation satisf uh, satisfying uh, in useful state is reachable in a valid product. Sorry, is reachable is a valid product. S, S is reachable in a valid product is satisfied together is uh, further formula that ask that all um, that there is no uh, transition outgoing from it from S which is uh, uh, labeled by a, a, a formula interpreted in two. And uh, is not uh, that transition, here we have two formula for transition, indeed the useful state used on their source state, uh, is not that transition, check that uh, the source of the transition is reachable, in a valid program in for all, if you want, for all valid uh, product in which T source is reachable, never uh, we found, sorry, we always uh, we found that the label of the transition is, uh, uh, is satisfied. So sorry, there is at least one case in which one valid product in which the source is reachable and the, the transition uh, outgoing P is uh, satisfied. Is, uh, yes, is satisfied, is, uh, is interpreted in two. And uh, maybe optional opt transition of T can be uh, defined by its useful state. So, is reachable in some valid program, the source, the source of the transition, and uh, the, uh, the, the label of the transition is not satisfied. If this happened for all uh, optional transition, then we have an answer to may be an optional transition. Indeed, uh, this formula does not correspond exactly to the ambiguity detection, because we have also to check if the formula labeling T is already true or not, but the algorithm take in account this point. Indeed, here we have uh, the same example that uh, Maurice has discussed before, and uh, it is easy to check that our uh, formula encoding uh, correspond exactly to the uh, ambiguity uh, that we have uh, discussed before. And indeed we have proved that uh, the three formula uh, are satisfiable exactly when we want. We decide, we, we make us able to, to uh, identify the, the ambiguities by using a subsolver in this way, by using the algorithm that I will introduce now, that I am introducing now, uh, where for each state, we look if there is a, an outgoing transition, indeed the, the definition of uh, um, hidden deadlock state is that uh, um, S is not an hidden deadlock of the, the FTS. So if there is some outgoing transition, we put the immediately the, the Boolean variable H add to force. Otherwise, what we do is to call by using uh, the, the subprogram, the, the the function check, we call the SAT solver and we ask the SAT solver uh, the verification of the satisfiability of the formula built 
by by the the, the subroutine, the sub program, the, the the function that we had just uh, described. For uh, the dead transition and the first option on transition, we have to uh, execute for each state, for each transition, for each state, for each transition in common in the state, we uh, set the variable, the, the Boolean flag, key dead to not check is not that transition, this is maybe a bit involuted, uh, but uh, yes, it works. And if the transition is dead or uh, the transition is already labeled by true, we set false optional to false. Already we set the false optional to not check. So maybe optional transition. Um, <clears throat> So this is the algorithm that using our uh, formula constructor uh, supply these three formulas in some cases to the sub solver, which is check and uh, store in, uh, in our global data structure, the information on the ambiguity of uh, states and uh, transitions. Quickly, I just say that uh, uh, for each given uh, whatever we want uh, propositional formula, we can build an FTS that show that uh, uh, essentially reduce the, the problem of the sub satisfiability of this formula to uh, a, um, a problem of ambiguity detection on these uh, uh, future future transition system. Indeed, uh, uh, here there are many redundancy in the sense that uh, uh, the transition here is dead if and only if phi is not satisfiable, or if we want, we can check if not phi is not satisfiable, is happen if and only if uh, uh, the transition, the only transition in this FTS is false option. Please uh, uh, make immediately clear that uh, the FTS ambiguity detection is NPR. So all problems which are uh, non-deterministic uh, polynomial can be reduced to our program, which is here. Indeed, we can say something more by a slight modification of our algorithm by some consideration on a slight modification of our algorithm, which uh, show has that uh, the FTS ambiguity detection is indeed NP complete. So it's not only hard, it can be here there are some problem which is maybe exponential, but it's also uh, non-deterministic polynomial, so NP complete. Uh, to conclude, I just say that we implemented uh, the algorithm in uh, Zeta3. Uh, we made uh, our implementation publicly available and uh, our artifact has been uh, badged by in SPLC uh, 19 uh, by, by this badge of the ACM and uh, um, that uh, Zeta3 is a cross-platform uh, uh, solver by Microsoft, which is freely available and support a lot of uh, additional feature and uh, is used in a lot of applications. Um, so uh, I, 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 I don't know if there is some question, otherwise I, I leave the word to Me <laughs> to you. Ah, okay. I don't. I was not a member who was speaking on this last part. Okay. So I. Well, well. If anyone has a question for Luca, I will in the meanwhile start sharing. Way I, I will look to Slack uh, also or tomorrow. I hope no, maybe to, to later. Okay. I will be, yeah. You see, you see my slides again. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, let me just uh, go to full screen mode. Okay, so uh, just to just a little less than ten minutes, I hope, before the break. Um, examples and experience. So here we are, the last part of uh, last part of part one. So examples. So this is uh, the vending machine. The vending machine we have seen uh, before. Luca took over. And uh, the result, so if we perform, if we, um, perform our uh, static analysis algorithm on this uh, small FTS, then, uh, well, we see the result below. So we see that had, all states are live, right? So that's uh, no hidden deadlocks, and no dead transitions. And we see that we have one, two, three, six, uh, one, two, three, six false optional transitions and no, uh, as I said, no hidden deadlock states. These six false optional transitions are here indicated with red. So it's, it's actually quite obvious, right? So these are typical, uh, let's say, second transitions with the same feature labeling as the one before. So if you go from state one to state two and there's no F, then in state two, you can only, so it's not necessary to require again that there's no F because if you got to state two, you already know this. Okay, so uh, we, we can save, uh, so we can just put there true and the, the, the behavior will not change. Okay, and for analysis, this may be very useful. But it's not a main point for the developers. Much more serious are the depth transitions and the hidden deadlock states. OK, so here's uh, the mind pump example. So for those of you that work a little bit in uh, software product lines and behavior models, the mind pump uh, should be a well-known example. It's one of the bigger ones. And um, it was uh, one of the examples in this uh, most influential paper I cited before, the XE 2010. And uh, if we, so this is the one, it says about 25 states and some 40, 40, 50 transitions. And uh, the results actually, it's not live. So there is a hidden deadlock state and it's state 20. So that's this one indicated here in red. Now what actually happens is that, so this feature model, well, forget about the, the details, but this feature model, um, it has 64 product, it gives rise to 64 uh, product configurations. And it requires the presence of this feature L, which is like um, a water level measurement, okay? And well, this is the here from state S6, which is the in, initial state of this uh, FTS. We go to S7, and then we can get one of three messages. Uh, and this message can be about the command, about uh, uh, the methane alarm, and it can be about the water level, okay? And this one about the water level requires the presence of this feature L, which is there. And then based on a high level, low level, or normal level, uh, there, there are some reactions. But uh, the feature model, unfortunately, allows also the situation in which uh, neither, neither of these three features, L, LH, LL, and LN, are present. And, uh, and therefore, in state um, S20, there's a, a hidden deadlock. So this can easily be reduced either by making this an explicit deadlock state in, this, in the technique we have shown, but it's, it can also be, and that's why this is, uh, shows a good example of what we mean that an, ambigu an ambiguity should be signaled to the developer because a much more obvious solution, and in fact, it's the solution chosen in later papers by the same authors uh, on these FTSs, is to change a little bit the feature model. So <clears throat> to not only uh, so to require the, um, the presence of either one, at least one of these three features, LN, LH, and LL. Okay, so to put them in an OR uh, relationship. That's been done in, in later papers. And that avoids this, um, uh, this uh, deadlock state. So also when this mind pump has been modeled in, in for example, in Pramala, when, it, when there were some papers where it has been model checked the spin, then there was actually, a, a, in the absence of these features, there was a transition that went back, let's say. So there are other solutions. It's up to the developer. So it's for us, we signal this situation, this hidden deadlock state. So be aware that there are products where this is a deadlock state. Actually, in this case, there are eight products where this occurs. And the developer can solve it, either by changing the model or by changing the feature model or both, okay? So that, that's uh, just two, two examples. So we have performed our um, algorithm uh, um, on, uh, on uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, uh, let's say what we call benchmarks for FTSs. So there are not that many FTSs in the literature. Uh, so there's this vending machine, the coffee machine subcomponent, and then there's various variants and pieces of the mind pump example. The complete one is quite big already with 418 states and over 1000 transitions. So you cannot uh, analyze that by hand anymore. And then there's this Clairline uh, system, which is like, uh, uh, what was it? Um, a web system 
uh, which was introduced in, uh, for a testing paper in Advamos 2014. It has 117 states and more than 11,000 transitions. So no means to do this by hand, right? These are the actions, number of actions. And uh, well, here are the results uh, concerning liveness. We've seen the problems with the mind pump. Dead transitions, they occur in this coffee submachine. It's basically an um, inconsistency in the constraints. Uh, you can find details in, in the papers I will provide. We will provide at the end of the tutorial. So the number of false optional ones, which I remember is the ones that are less, uh, so they're not really errors, but they're you know, things to consider for the developer. And most of all, uh, by, by removing them, uh, um, verification uh, at the behavioral level becomes more efficient. And then there's this hidden deadlock states, which again have to do with liveness, which also for ver verification purposes is very important uh, to solve them. <coughs> runtimes, so we see very good runtimes, even the, the one with 11,000 transitions still reasonable, some 40 minutes. And uh, well, this was done on a basic laptop, right? Uh, so not, nothing really uh, particular. And this is the improvement. So Luca has explained you, maybe not completely explicitly we did this, but uh, yeah, I think, so we explained that we had an original algorithm at the SPLC 2019 uh, paper, and we had an improvement then in the set solving. In this original implementation, we actually did some depth first search in the in the graph, which is very inefficient. And in fact, we got timeouts for the most uh, for the biggest FTSs. We could not handle them. Timeout occurred after more than two hours. And uh, the implementation that uh, Luca has been discussing, this algorithm and set solving that you have seen, it is a, the paper uh, um, in the special issue on SPLC 2019 in, uh, in empirical software engineering 2021 that's about to appear. Um, there we have uh, been able to verify also these more, um, uh, more complex ones. And these are actually the runtimes I showed you on the previous slides, right? So up to 40 minutes. So the speed up in runtime, even for those that we could already uh, verify also with the old algorithm is still considerable, let alone those for those that uh, ran out of, uh, out of uh, runtime. And then uh, what uh, Luca also explained that we see we actually had this algorithm in two parts. And the four, first part, which was this uh, lines one to 10, more or less, considered only the, the liveness detection, so the hidden deadlock detection. And if we apply only that, so we actually applied it only to the biggest ones, let's say, so the, the, the biggest three FTSs, the ones with hundreds of states and, and, um, and hundreds of transitions. Um, we only do these first 10 lines, so only the deadlocked liveness uh, transition, which is what we need for the model checking that will be the main argument in the second part. We see that if we only do this specialized implementation, the only the first 10 lines, this, this part, then we see that the runtime considerably improves. Okay, so we see uh, that the fraction of runtime needed for this liveness detection is very small. You see, eight, eight, 86 seconds only of, the, of this uh, 2,400 seconds. Okay, so only 4%, not even. So, so for, for the purpose of uh, family-based model checking, which we will discuss in the second part, this is very, very good news. Okay, so uh, let us wrap, wrap up very briefly the, the first part. More just a little bit over time. Um, so we had this uh, idea of uh, checking, finding, and removing ambiguities in feature transition systems. This was the subject of our uh, SPLC 2019 paper, which uh, won the best paper award at that conference. And uh, we got this ACM badge for reproducibility of our artifacts. So starting from an FTS, we are able to detect ambiguities and we are able to remove them with tooling. Um, why did we do this? Because First of all, we want to signal this to the modeler, but second of all, we have this tool, which uh, we will be shown in a demo in the second part, which is called uh, VMC, okay, <clears throat> and that can do family-based model checking of MTSs with some variability constraints. So as an end user, you can have uh, an, uh, your model in an MTS, and you can do uh, a kind of family-based model checking, in particular, if the MTS is live. So that's the same liveness concept of no hidden deadlocks. In that case, in a specific uh, CTL-like formula, uh, if, if you write it uh, using only a certain type of properties, you can find this in a ver verify this in a family-based manner. In a family-based manner, in the sense that if your property holds, then we know it holds for all variants without even having to generate these variants. So if it's not uh, of, um, if it doesn't hold, or if it's not of this type of formula, then you have to do it product by product. Okay, so this is a family-based model checking that only works in specific cases, but it's a large subset, this logic. Okay, so this is something that we presented back in uh, SPC 2014. 
So what do we want? Uh, and we will present in the second part of our tutorial. We want to combine these two aspects. So what we have seen here on the left side is that by removing ambiguities, we can actually uh, uh, make sure that uh, do a test that our FTS is live. Okay, so if it's not, we have to do family-based model checking or whatever with external tools. But if the FTS is live after, uh, you know, doing the rem ambiguous removal and testing, and we have seen that this is very efficient also for very large FTSs, then we can actually transform the FTS into an MTS and we can apply FTS for VMC, which has been, uh, which is the front end that will be presented tomorrow at, uh, at this conference. At that point, we enter the old, uh, let's say, a VMC tool, so we can apply this. We can again check if this is a type of formula that uh, uh, gives way, paves the way to very family-based model checking with VMC. Okay, so note now that we provide provide an entrance into VMC with FTSs or MTSs. Okay, we end up in the same testing. If it if it satisfies these two conditions, then we can do family-based model checking, and a valid product holds for all variants. If it does not, in the case of FTSs, we have to do an external tool, for example, proof lines developed uh, in the uh, University of Namur yeah. um, by Maxime Cordy and others. And uh, if it's an MTS, then we have to do the very product by product uh, with VMC. Okay. So the tooling we will explain in the second part of our tutorial allows an end user to start either from an FTS or an MTS and do a kind of family-based model checking. For the, M for the FTS, he first has to do he or she first has to do some ambiguity analysis and some transformation, but we will show that this can be automated and very efficiently done. And uh, for the MTS, you can do that directly in VMC. Okay, so uh, we have a short break now, and uh, in the second part, we will explain how this works. Thank you, Maurice, also for the presentation about my book. Okay, okay, excellent. So should I um, pause the recording during the I break? I think you can, uh, you can pause the recording during the break. I think that would be the best. That probably also gives like two videos, not, not that long <laughs> to, to watch if somebody wants to. Thanks. Okay. Sharing my screen. Okay, thanks. I'll start sharing my screen then. And as usual, I am asking you if you can see the slides. Yep. Yeah, great. Okay, so I think I, <clears throat> I think we should just start. And uh, I mean, it will be available on YouTube and we will have lots of viewers there. <laughs> okay, so here's the second part of this tutorial. Um, so a brief recall of what we presented in the first part. And as I said, you can go and see it on YouTube. Uh, so they introduced the basics of behavioral variability modeling analysis, in particular feature transition system as the computational model, uh, explained uh, the definitions of that uh, transitions, false optional transitions as mir mimicked uh, from uh, feature model anomalies, and also uh, hidden deadlocks, hidden deadlock states. And uh, then uh, Luca showed how we can actually uh, statically analyze the FTSs uh, by coding this into a SAT problem and a very efficient uh, implementation that finds uh, all dead transitions, all false optional transitions and all hidden deadlocks. And I uh, showed uh, then uh, how we applied this to some benchmark experiments uh, from the literature. And uh, I also uh, showed you what was the scope of all of this and uh, that will be explained now in the second part. So the scope is this picture. And uh, for, to understand that, <laughs> I showed it too shortly now, but this was at the end of the first part as well. So we have to know something about model transition systems, and in particular, the variant with variability constraints. Some principles of model checking, which is uh, an analysis verification technique that, uh, that the tooling will be using. And the temporal logic, which is uh, in which the properties that we want to verify are expressed. So some basics. Uh, basic temporal logics, LTL, CTL, and then the specific variant of action-based CTL of which we introduced the variability aware variant, which is called uh, VACTL. And then the tooling, there will be a demo of VMC that can do family-based model checking of uh, MTSs. And uh, I will show you then uh, the theory, I mean, we will show then the theory of how this family-based model checking of FTSs uh, <clears throat> and the theory I've shown before of transforming FTSs into MTSs 
uh, can be applied uh, in this tool chain, which consists of VMC on the background and then FTS for VMC, which is newly developed and will be presented tomorrow at uh, the conference. Uh, how we can then uh, ver do family-based model checking either of MTSs or of FTSs and then transform it into MTSs. And that's another demo towards the end of uh, part two. So the overall picture looks like this. We have an end user. He has either an initial MTS or an FTS. If you have an MTS, you can use existing tooling to see whether this uh, MTS is live. And then uh, uh, if it's not, do product-based uh, ver verification with our VMC metal checker. Or if it is, and uh, has a formula in a specific format, then you can do family-based uh, verification in the sense that if the formula holds, it holds for all variants. No need to generate the products or look at the products. You will know that the property will hold for all variants. And um, if it does not, then you have to use external tooling, for example, proof lines uh, for FTSs, or go back to product-based verification with VMC in case of MTSs. So as I said, also FTSs are a possible input model. Then, however, you have to remove the ambiguities with our tool, and uh, again, have to see if the FTS is live. If it is, then uh, we can transform it into an MTS, and we can go back to the VMC tooling on the background. And if it's not, then we have to do external, uh, use an external tool for, uh, for verification. Okay, so I will explain the ingredients of this uh, picture in this second part uh, together with my colleagues. Um, well, you have to check the YouTube uh, recording of the first part uh, where we introduced uh, the band. Okay, uh, so model transition systems with variability constraints. So uh, that's where we are in the table of contents. So the main ingredient is a model transition system. And that's basically a label transition system, which we've seen before, uh, with a distinction between admissible may transitions and necessary must transitions. And they were introduced a long time ago uh, at LIX uh, 88. And this uh, has been shown to be used for formalism uh, to show in a you know, compact way all the possible behavior of a family of uh, products, and in this case, LTSs of a product line or a product family. <clears throat> However, uh, these MTSs, without any further constraints, they cannot uh, model all variability constraints, and particularly not those uh, concerning alternative features or the crusty constraints uh, requires and excludes. Okay, this has been shown in the, in the literature. So we have a solution. We add a specific set of variability constraints to the MTS, and uh, that allows us to decide which of the products, so LTSs, are valid and which are not. Okay, and we use this in, uh, for our tooling. So recall that an LTS has states, actions, an initial state, and transitions which allow you to perform an action and go from one state to another, starting from the initial state. A model transition system with variability constraints, on the other hand, is a sextuple. So we have, again, states, uh, actions, initial state, and a two transition relations. And the union of them, if we just consider them as a union, is an LTS. However, we distinguish them. So we have must transitions indicated with this box relation, uh, may transitions indicated with this diamond relation, and a set of variability constraints. So formally, we have uh, two distinct transition relations, as I said, admissible transitions and necessary transitions. However, by definition, any necessary transition is also admissible. So that means that this, translation, uh, this transition relation is included in, in, in the other one. And actually, the, the difference between these two sets, we note them as optional transitions. And in a graphical format, we indicate these optional transitions by dashed uh, arrows and uh, the must transitions by uh, solid arrows. So this would be an MTS. OK, so it's an LTS with a distinction between two types of transitions, may transitions, must transitions. Uh, in this case, sorry, optional transitions and uh, must transitions. And uh, this is the same vending machine that we've seen in the first part, very simple. And uh, we have an additional set of variability constraints, which I will define on the next uh, slide. So the basic idea for those who have not been uh, following the first part is that uh, starting in state one, you can pay, uh, get your change, choose soda, you've been served soda, you can open the compartment, take your soda and it's closed. Or you can do another thing, you can, uh, if, if the option is available, you can have a free drink, uh, for example, tea, serve, we serve tea and take it. OK, so these variability constraints, this looks complex, but basically think of a feature model. Think of a feature model with uh, alternative uh, features, excludes uh, constraint constraints, requires constraint constraints, etc. And then this uh, basically codifies in, uh, in um, Boolean uh, operators and in Boolean composition, 
uh, a translation of the feature model. Okay, and you can provide this. So alt stands for alternative, or stands for the or relation, excludes relation, requires relation, and combinations thereof. This is basically a one-to-one -one translation of the feature model into logical terms. Uh, note that uh, because of uh, conjunctive normal form for propositional logic, actually it suffices to have this second, uh, uh, let's say second type of constraints here. So you have a, a big or where all the literals are either uh, you know, uh, a feature or the negation of a feature. That's sufficient. Okay, uh, but that's a technical detail. Okay, so look, let's look back at this, uh, at this MTS with variability constraints, which I will show you on the next slide. So we have a, um, a coding in a very simple uh, process algebra of this uh, graphical format. So basically we start in a state S1 or in a process S1, okay? That's basically the state S1. And then we can pay and go to S2, or we can, this plus stands for the or, choice. So, or we can have a free action and go to uh, three, et cetera, et cetera. You can follow this, it's a literal translation of this part. To be able to distinguish these two different take actions, uh, we actually call them take paid and take free. And uh, well, this, this sense that S1 is the initial state, and then we have this additional set of, um, of constraints. So that's basically codified like this. So we simply say pay, alt, free. So that means that pay is alternative. So the feature pay or the action pay in this case is alternative to, um, to free. So that means be uh, precisely one is uh, present, okay? And then um, we have uh, soda or tea. So it means be at least one is present, but possibly also both. And then we have a take free if and only if free. That's a shorthand notation for one requires. Uh, so take free requires free and pre requires take free. So that means either both or none are present. And then we have again an uh, example of precisely one. So the alternative open and take free. And this kind of codifies what to do with these optional transitions, which are the best ones. Because a valid solution to these constraints gives you a choice of these uh, optional transitions. So let's look at this more concretely. So a choice means uh, configuring a product. So intuitively, a product LTS, so that means a projection of this MTS into an LTS where we have only one type of transitions. Uh, how do we get that? We include all mass transitions. So all these solid transitions, they are by definition included. Okay, we include a subset of the optional transitions, reachable of course, and we remove the rest. So these optional transitions, these dashed ones, we include some and we remove some others. They have to satisfy the assumptions of coherence and consistency, which I explain right now on the second part of this slide. And they have to satisfy the variability constraints, which are these four, okay? So if I say pay out free, it means precisely one must be present. I cannot choose to keep both this transition and this transition because then they are not um, precise. It's not the case that precisely one is present, but both would be present. Okay, so if I follow these four uh, <coughs> uh, uh, rules, then uh, each such selection gives rise to a different variant. And it's the same 12 variants that we've seen before. Formally, it is basically important to know what is coherence. So coherence is this. If I have an optional transition, for example, labeled with A, okay, then I do not also have a mass transition labeled with A. So that means, uh, coherence means that the feature is either, you can see it, in this case, it's an action, but you can understand it as a feature. It's either an optional or a mandatory feature. So we want to have the same uh, at the level of actions. So either it's optional or it's mandatory, but cannot be both. Okay, so that's a syntactic definition on MTS. And then we have another one, which is uh, consistency. And the consistency is obtained when we create the products. So what does it mean? If I have an optional transition and I turn it into a mass transition, okay, according to um, stay, uh, point two of this, uh, of this intuitive algorithm. So I include a subset of the optional transitions and I remove the rest. What does it mean including? Including means that it becomes a part of the LTS. So it becomes a mass transition. So if I do that, I make one optional transition with an A label, a mass transition with an A label, then I cannot also uh, throw away another such transition, okay? So there can be more than one occurrence of the same uh, transition in, in such an MTS. And once I make a choice of keeping it or removing it, this choice has to be consistent throughout the MTS, okay? That, that's basically all uh, you need to know and you can create products. So let's look at this concretely, it's much easier. So here's the MTS and we have also the variability constraints. 
This, believe me, is a set of, uh, of actions or features which is, uh, satisfies the variability constraints. Okay? And at that point, it means that I have chosen uh, to keep the action pay, the feature action feature pay, soda, tea, and open. So from state one, I did not keep free. So I have removed free. In fact, if I keep pay, which is here, I remember the, the first of the variability constraints, which said P, pay is alternative to free. If I keep pay, I cannot keep free. Okay, in fact, it's not kept. So I have, this is a, a, a one product, valid product. I can pay, get my change, choose either a soda or a tea, be served the soda or tea, open the compartment, take my uh, soda or tea, and it closed again. And then this can be repeated by the same or another user. Another product, for example, is the one where cancel uh, is shown to be, to be kept. Okay, so you see pay change, and then you can actually change your mind and decide not to take a drink after all. And in this case, there's no tea. I didn't choose to keep, uh, keep tea. Remember that soda and tea were in or relation, soda or tea, meaning that I have either soda or tea or both. Okay, but I cannot have none. So you cannot stop in state three. I have to have one of them. Okay, so these are two valid products, actually the same valid products we have seen before uh, in the first part of the tutorial. And uh, well, then uh, in, in another work, um, that, that we did uh, with the presenters of this, of this tutorial, we showed that uh, these MTSs with variability constraints, they are equally expressive as feature transition systems, where expressibility is uh, considered at the level of products. So what does it mean? That if I have an FTS and, um, uh, and an MTS, then they generate the same set of products, so the same set of LTSs, up to some dummy transitions and an action relabeling. So I can transform any FTS into an MTS and have the same set of products. We have another result that says that I can do the other way around. So I can transform any MTS with variability constraints into an FTS, and then they will still have the same set of products. So this shows together that uh, they're equally expressive. And that's at the basis of, uh, of this possibility to use the model checker for either FTSs or MTSs. Okay, so now I've been talking a lot also about model checking. For those of you not familiar with model checking, I will now explain the principles of model checking and the temporal logic, which you do do any model checking at all. And then we will see how this works in practice. Okay, so what is model checking? This, uh, this figure and, uh, and also the text on the next slides is taken from the, one of the basic books on model checking, uh, the one by Bayer and Katun from 2008. So you have requirements, which you formalize in some kind of logic and property specification, and you have a system which you model in some kind of uh, system model, okay? You put the property specification and the system model into something which is called the model checker. So you perform model checking, and you either get an answer that says it's satisfied, yes. So this property holds for the system model, or you, uh, you get the answer, no, it does not, it's violated. This property for this system model is violated and it provides, your model checker provides a counterexample. <clears throat> a counterexample is actually a trace, a simulation, let's say, through the behavior of your system that shows that you can arrive at the point where, where you, uh, which you in your property specification said you could not or vice versa. You said you could never get there and you can't get there. So that means an error. And what you typically do then is, is revise either your property or your model. So the phases are three. We have a modeling phase where you model the system that you're considering. You do uh, some uh, simulations to see if your model is more or less what you expect it is, very quick assessment. You formalize the property you want to check in the specific property specification language, which is typically a logic. And then you run the model checker. So you have an input, a system model and the property, and it gives you an answer. Then you have the analysis phase. If the property is satisfied, you go to the next property. If you want to verify more of them, and if it's violated, you analyze this counterexample. You go and simulate it. You see where how you can get there. You either refine the model or uh, the design or the property, and you repeat the procedure. If, and that is a, one of the negative sides we will see now on the next slides of model checking, you run out of memory, then you have to use a smaller model. So you have to either reduce it with existing techniques, or you have to you know, uh, consider a smaller part of the model or a part, uh, smaller set of components of the system and try again. So the strengths and weaknesses of uh, model checking as given in the book, which bas basically uh, are, are, are a number of them. In particular, we would like to focus on this strength, which is that it's basically a push button technology. As you saw, it's like a black box uh, in which you put 
uh, you don't need to know much about how it works, right? In this sense, it's a push button technology. You need to be able to specify a property. You need to be able to uh, model a system. And then you just push the button and it will give you the answers and allows you, I mean, the better the model checker is developed, it will help you to understand the answer. Okay, so that's good. That's uh, uh, an important condition, for example, for application in practice. Of course, writing the specification and making the model, that's non-trivial. Then we go to the, to the weaknesses, which is exactly what I just said. So if you want to verify, uh, do model checking, you actually verify system model and not the system itself, okay? So the obtained result is as good as the system model. And for that, you need some uh, you know, hand-on experience. And moreover, you only verify what you have uh, specified, okay? So you have no guarantee of completeness. You, you specify a number of properties and you know for them that they are true or false or whatever. You, 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 you repeat it, you change your model, and then in the end, all your properties are true. It doesn't mean that everything is true, but because you only uh, verified a, a specific set of properties, right? So there may be another property that's false and you, that was an important property. Okay, so no guarantee of completeness. All right, the temporal logics. Uh, we will treat a few of them. So basically, we are here now. Basically, uh, for this, we recall this doubly labeled transition system. So it's again a transition system that we have seen many times in this tutorial. And we have actions on the transitions that go from one state to another. And we have state labels. Okay, so we have labels on the states. In this case, taken on state one, paid on state two, etc. We have already seen this. Okay, and we have seen that uh, a system evolutions can be thus described by a directed graph. Okay, we have seen many examples. Basic, the basic one, LTSs, doubly labeled transition systems, FTSs, MTSs, etc. The principle is always the same. We have nodes, we have edges, we have actions between. Uh, so we have uh, actions that take you from one node to an edge to another node, and we can walk uh, through this graph, okay, and reason on properties that hold for such a graph starting from the initial state uh, by evaluating so-called temporal logic uh, formulas. So for that, we need to know something about temporal logic. And they are, uh, that's a logic composed of temporal operators. And uh, here are some of the most classical temporal operators. Uh, so always, so we have this, uh, this symbol G and the phi is a formula. So always phi or globally phi, it means that this property phi, it holds from now on. So we start in initial state and it holds always. Eventually, on the other hand, means that this uh, formula phi, it's eventually true in the future. Okay, that's the F. Next simply means that this formula is true in the next state. Okay, so you make one step and there this formula has to hold. Until is uh, written like this, you have a formula uh, phi one until phi two, meaning that phi two eventually will be true at some point in the future. And until that point is reached, phi one is always true. Okay, so we have a timeline where F1 holds and a certain point F2 uh, for phi one holds and a certain point phi two holds. Okay, so depending on this specific form of, form of application framework that we use, these formulas can be evaluated either independently, so on, on the execution sequences without considering the ramifications uh, of the system evolution, so the branching structure, so all the, all the choices that we have at certain points, or considering actually this whole branching structure and looking at this, the tree as it, uh, as it branches uh, it at once. And uh, then these operators, these, uh, these operators and these specific properties that have to hold in a certain state or in a certain uh, point, they can refer either to uh, names of events, actions uh, in the systems we have seen, so labels of the transitions, or uh, properties of the states, so labels on the states, these atomic, prop atomic propositions on the states, or to both, okay? And that these uh, ingredients basically distinguish the typical logics that are considered. So linear tempo logic uh, considers a single run uh, through, through the system in a linear sense, a certain path, and then uh, we require to hold for all paths, but we always consider one path in a linear way at a time. Okay, so for example, this property, which says that uh, G serving implies F taken, okay? So this can be seen as it is always globally true that a state satisfying serving, so like this state here, seven, okay? It's eventually followed by a state after, that follows this, this one, satisfying taken. 
So it means that whatever run get to this state, uh, sorry, seven, then I'm in serving, okay? And then there's no way to continue, but um, to, to, to reach a state uh, labeled taken, okay? In this case, state one. And you see this, okay? Whatever you continue, you eventually end up in state one, which satisfies taken. Clear so far? I hope so. Is there anybody listening still? Yes. Ah, okay, great. Uh, it's really annoying not to have any interaction with the audience. So sorry for asking, but suddenly one worries if he's talking <laughs> to, a, to a wall or not. Okay, so another example is eventually taken, eventually serving. So for all paths, if the path eventually contains a future state satisfies taken, then it also contains a future state satisfies serving. Okay. And these kind of uh, these kind of properties are considered on single runs through this graph. Then we have computation tree logic, which uh, is a branching time logic. So it's a little bit different. We consider now all paths uh, through through this uh, through this graph at the same time. So it says for all paths, it's globally true. So I look at all the ramifications that uh, there exists a possibility to eventually reach a future state satisfying taken. Okay, so A, G, E, F taken. So it means that whatever path starting from the initial state one, whatever route I choose through this graph, okay, whatever actions in a row I perform, okay, I always reach a state taken. This one or this one, okay. Then we have uh, action-based competition tree logic, which actually considers a mixture. Uh, so now we consider, so it's different. We, we consider actions rather than the state properties. And we associate them to these temporal operators that we've seen before. So in this case, we see uh, actions associated to the, um, uh, to the eventually operator, which is the F, take or cancel, right? So we see AF, take or cancel. And it uh, means that all paths, that's the A, eventually, that's the F, lead to a transition for which take or cancel holds, right? Take or cancel, okay? So whatever uh, path uh, through this uh, graph I, I take, I either pass a, a um, transition with take or I pass one with cancel, okay? So if I pass, if I turn back here, I pass the one with cancel. If I continue, I will always pass take or take either here or there, okay? So you can see that this holds. And um, then uh, we have this shorthand notation for not uh, eventually next action, not phi. So this is a shorthand, this box operator. And it basically means the following. So if pay holds for one of the next transitions, okay? So if pay holds for one of the next transitions, for example, in the first state, we have this pay holds here, okay? Then after it, there must exist a next transition. So a, a transition that follows for which change holds. So in fact, we see that in state one, we have this condition that pay holds for one of the next transitions. And then after it, which means we are in state two, in fact, there exists a next transition for which change hold. Okay, so if I follow this pay, then there exists a next state, a next transition, sorry, labeled with change. Okay, in this case, this holds. And these, so you see that these two operators, they, they consider actions specifically. Okay, so then we have uh, this variability where ACTL that we introduced. And this is basically ACTL, so action-based CTL, plus, so branching time logic, plus, but also uh, action-based and branch, action-based and state-based. So it's a branching time logic, but action-based and state-based. So it's ACTL that we have seen on the previous slide, plus some dedicated variability where versions of temporal operators. So the, the specific temporal operators that, so what, some examples of temporal operators that are extended with this variability awareness, uh, which is denoted by this box are as follows. So we have seen F uh, phi before, which meant that phi is eventually true in the future, okay? But now with this box, we say that not only phi is eventually true in the future, but until that point, all transitions are must transitions. So we can reach, this future uh, situation where phi holds by mass transitions, okay? And uh, well, in this case, we concern states, but we can also add uh, actions to this operator. So we have uh, chi here, 
And this means the same as the operator we've seen before, but this specific point in the future, it's reached by executing an action satisfying chi. And chi is a Boolean composition of actions. Okay, so transition labels. And we have seen, we, we can see also um, a variability where a variant of the next operator. So it means as before that phi is true in the next state, but this state has to be reached by a mass transition. Okay. And then we have the action based variant of this. So it means that as before, uh, we can reach, uh, so phi is true in the next state reached by a mass transition, but not only it's reached by a mass transition, this mass transition is also labeled with an action satisfying chi. Okay. So this v, 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 uh, then this variant, VSETL life box, uh, we have no better name for it. It's a specific subset of this variability where ACTL logic with the following property, which is very important, which this property says that any formula which is true, so it holds for an MTS with variability constraints that is live, so that means it has no hidden deadlocks, okay? Then this formula is also true for all products so for all LTSs, all these LTSs I can obtain by projection, the formula will hold. I will not have need to verify them on the products one by one, okay? So for this example of the vending machine where we have 12 products, it means you don't have to do this product by product verification on 12 products. You just do the verification on the MTS as long as this formula is composed of operators that are part of this log logic. And there's a big set of them. Uh, indeed, it contains universal properties so that hold for all execution paths. And if they hold for all paths, it means they also hold for those uh, that correspond to a product, okay? Then we have properties that hold for must paths. So if they hold for must paths, which are those mandatory ones, which if I project, I must keep them. So they are present in all products. So if a property holds on such uh, a situation, then it will be present in all products and hold for all products. And then there's the negation of existential properties that do not hold on any path, okay? These are of course preserved in, uh, in products. Okay, so example formulas for this specific uh, running example that we have here that can thus be verified in this kind of family-based manner. So family-based in the sense that you verify the property on the family model, you don't need to do it product by product and you know that the product property will hold for all products. And we can do this with a linear complexity because BMC has linear complexity, okay? So the first one is this AGAF, take free, take pay, take uh, or cancel. So it means that always globally, so on all paths, always eventually, I will do either a take free or a take paid or a cancel action, okay? This is the kind of uh, properties, the kind of uh, combination of uh, operators that are part of uh, variability where CTL life, okay? This is the same one. And note that they have this box here. So that means that it consists of mass transitions. If I remove this box, then it no longer holds because there may be a transition that will be removed in one of the products, okay? And then I have a, a final example. So there will be in the demo uh, examples of exactly these, uh, these three formulas. So you will see them in more detail on this example. Um, okay, I think I, uh, oh, there's something in the chat. Let's say, what was this? Okay, people on YouTube cannot reply, okay. So- a quick question about the logic. Um, oh yes, sorry. So just in the other, so now you you basically have a fragment of the logic that has this very nice property, that um, yeah you you know when when you when you test it on your um, family, then you know that it works for all the products. But how is it in the other direction? If you so basically is everything you can specify for a product, can this also be expressed in your uh, variability aware? Um, logic in your ACTL, the variability aware um, logic? Yeah, okay, but so so you can specify it, yes, but you cannot, uh, you, you don't know uh, beforehand if, if your property specified in this formula holds for a product, you don't know if it holds also for uh, for the whole family. So uh, the relation- yeah, but, but just, so it's, it's more a question about the logic, right? Uh, so what, a property that you can express for a product, this can also be expressed in your uh, variability aware ACTL. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, so, the, yes, the variability aware ACTL is just a, a subset of the ACTL logic. So it's a subset in the sense that there's certain operators that you can use and others that you cannot use. So uh, if you use these operators with boxes or one of these three, 
So the universal ones and those for must paths or negations of extension operators, then this will always hold also for all products. If you use an operator that is not, uh, or a formula that's not uh, satisfies this criteria, then it will not hold. But I think that in the demo, there will be actually examples of this. Uh, I think this, the second example that Franco will show will be a, a counter example to these. Uh, so, you, so you will shortly see, uh, in case you have one that does not uh, hold, you have still have to do it, generate all your products, in this case, 12, and verify it one by one. Okay, but the, the dual logic, let's say for normal, um, for the product, for the product, the dual logic yeah, I mean, would be dual, some ACTL the, or? So, so, the, the, it, this, so the logic is not really dependent on, uh, on the product or the family level. It's just a question of combining operators. So this box has no meaning on, uh, on the product level. Mm -hmm because the LTS will not have a distinction between may and must transitions. So it will simply uh, you know, have no meaning, the box operator. It will be the same as the, really the same as the one without the box. Okay. It's, okay. it's like it's not uh, variability aware, the, the logic. Yeah, the product the is not variability aware, exactly. So, so you don't need the logic that's variability aware, exactly. Can I ask also a question, Maurice? Sure. Uh, so you, since you also have the translation into FTS, it is possible to ask a uh, query uh, specified in, uh, in the variability aware logic, uh, ask this query if it holds on an FTS, right? Yeah, so you, so you can formulate a, a query in this logic on the FTS and ask if it holds. If it, if it is, consists only of uh, operators that are part of this VACTL live and <clears throat> the MTS is live, then uh, this property will hold for all products. I don't have to verify this. And this, uh, for this, I use this, um, this, this, this result. So there are two conditions here. First, your property has to be consisting of operators that are part of this logic. And second, your MTS has to be live. If that's the case, then actually there's a third condition, right? Which is that the formula that's true. Mm -hmm. okay? So if the formula holds for this live MTS, then it holds for all products. Yes, my question was more if instead of having an, a live MTS, you have an FTS. Ah, okay, if you have an FTS. Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's what we will, that's, that's, that's what, uh, so any live FTS can be trivially transformed into a live uh, MTS. And then, and, the, and if it's unambiguous, the FTS is unambiguous, then it's live. And then we can apply uh, VMC. So that's okay. basically what, what, uh, what we do. That's the contribution, let's say, that we allow, that, so that, that, we, that we manage to use the model checker that was actually conceived for MTSs. We managed to use it for FTSs. These FTSs have to specify a specific condition, which is that they have to be unambiguous. And the part that we need is the is the not hidden deadlocks. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, I will I will stop sharing, and then uh, the Franco will uh, show you the demo of uh, of VMC. Do you see something? Do you hear me? Yes, both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's try to see in more detail what is precisely this tool. This tool. So, so we are we are in the second part. Okay, we can skip that. So what is VMC? VMC, unfortunately, is not an industry ready tool which can be used by industry for production of a big uh, product lines or for, for formal verification of uh, critical systems. VMC is still an academic prototype which has been used for a rather long time, almost 10 years for research and for education. This VMC is part of a framework or a wider framework of model checkers and analyzer, which is being developed by our laboratory 
uh, this DSLR. VMC is free, freely usable uh, by uh, as a web service uh, from our site, uh, our laboratory site. Uh, it uh, can be can be it's executable file can be can, command line based can be freely downloaded for Windows Mac or Windows uh, machines. And uh, if someone's interested, they can also a local web server for macOS uh, can be installed on a local machine having the full power of the full framework with all the graphical user interface. Uh, the input models of VMC are given in the form of uh, process definition, algebraic process definitions. And we will see later a simple, see a few examples who does this mean. Uh, in any case, they mean that it is just a textual, it's a simple textual uh, notation for this plan for describing models. VMC, once uh, a model is accepted, can display uh, the evolutions of the system in the form of a model transition system graph. Uh, so uh, can display the graph where the edges can be dotted or continuous and labeled explicitly according to, to the actions which are being performed. Actually, to be precise, we should say that uh, the graph displayed is not just a model transition system, but a doubly labeled model transition systems because the states can have labels and, and uh, they have labels also associated to states. The logic supported is, uh, is uh, mostly what has been described by Maurice, which is uh, via CTL uh, live box. Um, it has a few more uh, operators which are not widely used, but in principle can be present, like fixed point, for example. But, but it is a different issue and are not particularly uh, being experimented very much. VMC allow both kinds of verification, but the most important one is a family-based verification. So you can just reason on the graph uh, like a model transition system of the, of, the mod, of the family, and you can verify properties which, hold, which are guaranteed to hold for all, for all the product, given that the properties are written in the appropriate logic, and given that the model transition system is live. In case of doubt or for understanding or for, for, for just for, for, for giving a bit more precise feedback, it is also possible to generate all the valid products according to the family constraints and separately verify them on the same pro property in order to see exactly which, uh, which products to satisfy, uh, satisfy a property and which not. So this is just a picture we show in the text. The one of the simple, this is the simplest way to express, to describe a system in, in, as a set of processes. Each, each equality is a, is a process definition. We have processes one, which can do, um, which has the choice of performing two actions and transforming either in process as or in process as three and so on. So we can just, given one model transition system, if we want, we can immediately translate this model transition system in the in a form of the textual process algebra by just defining one process for each node and defining the behavior of one process uh, as a choice of alternative uh, alternatives. Moreover, uh, since we, we are interested in constraining the model transition system, we can also add constraints which, which uh, have two main reasons. The main reason of the cost, one of the constraints is um, to allow to understand if the model transition system, if the, any node of the model transition system is a life node or not. In particular, uh, for each node, for example, node S1, for node one, we have two alternatives, pay or free. If we have a construct which specifies that exactly, at least exactly one of the, of the two transitions must be present, then S1 can be deduced to be a, not, not, a, not a hidden deadlock. 
Clearly, all the nodes which have a mandatory transition uh, outgoing are life node. For example, a node four uh, is another node which might be a hidden deadlock unless we have the uh, explicit constraint soda or T, which guarantees that one of the two is present. A similar situation occurs for node seven, where we have the choice open or take free, which are both optional transitions. So in principle, we don't know if they are present or not. But if there is a constraint open, alt, take free, the model checker is able to understand that also S7 is a, not an hidden deadlock, and therefore the, the full uh, MTS is live. Not necessarily is always able to understand that the model transition system is really live, but um, if given all the appropriate constraints, it is, it is possible. The other reason for having constraints, um, I don't remember now what is the second reason. So for having, uh, for proving, no way, well, this is, this is, most, this is the reason, the reason which I don't remember why. <laughs> okay, if we can imagine, I will tell you what is the second reason. So uh, we can, uh, load the current model, and we can see uh, the evolutions of, uh, of the form of the doubly labeled model transition system, where we can see the where the system can understand uh, the, the, the evolutions and uh, generate automatically the graph. So again, which are the properties which are preserved? As I already said, there are properties that hold for all, for all uh, uh, the possible system executions. And now we try to, to see what does this mean. So this is a, this is a model checker, which is run remotely from, from my house to, to the server. I just... Uh, before just uh, if you want to see what is downloadable and uh, you can download the command line versions or you can download the, the components of the web basis uh, version if you want to see some more documentation of, uh, of um, this tool you can see the available documentation so we can select some of the examples just to see the current example which, on which we will be working is the event machine. So we can uh, load this model and uh, engineer ask to draw the family MTS. So and this is the, the, the generated model transition systems with, with W labeled. If we want to verify the properties, we can take, for example, uh, this one. This, the, the, we can see that once we verify a property, one of the possible answers of the tool is to say that the formula is true. And since the formula is of MTS alive, the formula holds for all the MTS variants. So what does this formula say? Let's try to see again. The, the formula says that it is always true that eventually we reach a state holding uh, for which values uh, we label it as S1. So does this mean that the, the system executes as a cycle which always uh, returns in state S1, which is just a simple property. <laughs> so another properties, uh, which was uh, second one, is that it is always true that uh, we can uh, either serve soda or serve T or cancel. So let's try to see.
Oh, it is done not hold. So this means that I've made some mistake. You need to uncapitalize cancel. I it's don't, a lowercase c. Yeah. It's lowercase it's, cancel. Okay, that's it. <laughs> now it works. <laughs> so it is a proof that it works. <laughs> and actually, this property is not uh, does not say anything particular new with respect to the previous one. The difference is that this one only acts on transition labels, where the first one was working on state labels. So let's see more interesting, more interesting property, which says that it is always true that if we pay, if we execute a pay action, we always will take uh, uh, what, what we have paid for. So it was we execute a pay action. We will always pay pay. I don't remember if it's the case. If it is a per score or not, maybe yes. Well, the formula is false. Why is it false? Is it normal that it is false? Uh, we can ask for an explanation. The formula is false because uh, the second part, eventually take paid, is not satisfied in the after we execute pay. The formula, it is not, uh, it eventually, it is always true that we take the action, take paid, is false in status two because there is a loop where from a C2, you can move to C3 and performing a change. Uh, from that state, you can perform a cancel and you can return to the initial state. This is true, this is what, what can happen. So it is true that this formula is false and being false, it is not guaranteed that uh, you, we don't say anything about, about what might happen in the in a false product. Actually, it is true that uh, this, this, pro this property might be false in some program, might be true in some other programs. If we want to, if we want to, to make a check, we can generate products. Which something is not working now. No, no, it is working. And check the same property. And we can see that this property holds only when um, either, the, the, either the product uh, is a free one, so we don't have to pay. So if we don't, if we don't pay, the formula is true because this first prefix, this, for, uh, this formula says, if we perform an action pay, so if we don't perform an action pay, pay the formula is true. Or if the, um, or if uh, the formula um, da, da, does not have the cancel, the cancel, uh, the cancel choice, because if, if it is free and you know, actually it's just only for it is free, um, but probably even if it is, product. Uh, Okay, we, we pay, so cancel. So it's clear when it is uh, true. I would just want to see if there is a case in which the, mm, there is an open, but there is no cancel. In this case, it's false. Why is in this case so false? So let's see. I think, I think, I think the P needs to be small, small P. Oh, yes, it is small P. It was present. Oh, 
So the situation is not much different. Uh, if we, so this is an also a demo of, of when we found a formula <laughs> and we find an error, the error we should be on the formula or on the model, <laughs> having a, a tool which allows to, to see the counter example in a clear way. Uh, so the, the, the situation is not different. But if we model check the products of the same formula, now we, we see that the formula can be true either when the, the product is free. So if it is free, we don't uh, have anything to evaluate apart from the first uh, part of the operation, or there is no cancel operation. Because if there is no cancel operation, it is true that uh, after having paid, we must necessarily after having paid, uh, we must necessarily perform a tech free operation. So uh, another example of formula that was shown before is this one, which is another, another comp uh, interesting formula. If uh, we perform a free action, so we, we have a free provider, it is for all execution paths, we will always end the cycle, but without ever taking any paid uh, drink. So let me try to remember. I can, can try to copy from me so I don't risk to. Um, I have to reload the model, unfortunately. So also in this case, we have a formula which is false in the model transition system. So we cannot guarantee what happens to the products. In this case, however, if we generate the products and verify the property of the products, we can see that the formula always holds for all the products. So what happens in this case? Why the model checker does not guarantee that the formula is true? The problem cannot guarantee because just looking at the structure of the model transition system, uh, without having previous knowledge of the way in which we have reached state, uh, state uh, uh, C7, we have no idea here of which of the two alternatives can be present. In order to understand that the formula holds for all the products, I should have put in relation the fact that I have reached the C7 only from free. Then in this case, I can guarantee that take free, the opening will not be possible. But if I don't have a, an history of, of how I have reached the state, uh, then I can only rely on what I can see in, on, on each state and on the knowledge that the state is live. So that one of these two transitions must be present. But this information is not sufficient to guarantee that uh, a formula which is false here will be present, uh, will be valid for all the products. Just for curiosity, uh, another example of formula uh, which has not been, which is just an example of form of negation, a form of existential negation. Uh, stupid, <laughs> for which just show the example. We say that it, it never happens. It cannot happen that the putting a coin in the machine, you will win a lottery ticket. Clearly it is false. Oh, okay, I want to verify it on the, on the MTS, not on the product.
real thesis formula is for it holds and is valid for true because why? Because it is a negation of an existential formula, which is always false. So and this, and this shows uh, the various kinds of property. Uh, I have a few minutes also, uh, so I can continue with the, with the new with the new benefits uh, only for those which have succeeded in, to to remain active in. Okay, we have seen so far a simple, a very simple model, which was just a, a direct representation of, uh, a of a transition system, a direct encoding of a model transition system. In general, process algebras can be more complex. It, it is an example where we have five processes which are composed in parallel by synchronizing their operations. And in, in this case, the model checker uh, results uh, uh, generates a model transition system, which is uh, several hundred states uh, large, uh, about 400, more than 400 states. And on that uh, model transition system, we can verify the properties, provided that the model is live. So uh, this is just to show that uh, the purpose of this example, just to show that uh, parallel, parallel uh, process algebras uh, uh, can be far more complex than just a, a single encoding of a single uh, diagram, synthetic diagram. The other interesting property of this system is that instead of giving explicitly the names of all the constraints, we can tell the model checker using a keyword live, uh, trust me, I guarantee that this model is live. So uh, it, it, without specifying all the precise constraints. If we do that, when we evaluate the, the uh, when we load the system, we can model check the system with a complex property. Or I will not describe the meaning precisely, but the intuitively the meaning of this formula is uh, within into systems, if at some time, AG, it is some time is generated an alarm, it will not happen that the alarm is generated again until something is done in the middle, which uh, resets the, 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 cause, the cause of the alarm. So also in this case, you can see that the formula is true and also the variance. Notice these two particular properties. The system is a big one obtained by composing, uh, uh, composing uh, parallel processes and uh, the liveness of the system is guaranteed from the, uh, from the outside. How can we guarantee? How can we guarantee that the system is live from the outside of the system without specifying the constraints? One way, which will be seen in the next, uh, in the next uh, continuation of the, of the tutorial, is by using external tool like the, like the verification of ambiguity detection of the system, which allows to using complex analysis tool to verify the liveness of a system, taking care of considering the feature model and, and all the related dependencies which can be deduced from, from that model. But this will be seen in the next continuation. And I think this is all for now. So I can pass the, the presentation to Giordano. Uh, thank you, Franco. Okay, now I share my screen. Okay. Okay, can you see it? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, now that we have introduced uh, uh, the variability model checker, uh, what we want to do is, uh, the is to use the family-based model checking on feature transition system. Uh, 
uh, we can uh, we are now in the, the last part of the second part and we we can uh, start the family family based model checking by by analyzing these two notion the the first notion is that any fts uh, can be trivially transformed into an mts by converting every mass transition so transition inside the feature inside the fts with uh, feature expression true into necessary transition of the model transition system and the feature transition system into optional transition uh, all the uh, all transition are considered admissible and we remove all the feature expression uh, the second important notion is that if the fts is unambiguous so it does not contain any hidden deadlock the transition or false optional transition then the corresponding mts is live uh, these allow to carry over the result for uh, mts with variability constraint to unambiguous fts this was proven in a previously published paper so we now we can uh, any formula phi expressed in uh, in a VACT live box uh, is preserved by a live FTS. So given a, a live FTS, we know that the model transition system constructed from the feature-add transition system using this method, if the property is valid for this model transition system, then the property is valid also for every product of the feature transition system. And by uh, exploiting the new constraint live, we can uh, skip the, the checking on, uh, on constraint using VMC. Uh, so uh, FTS for VMC is a uh, front end for VMC. And uh, it, is a, it is still a, a research tool uh, developed in Python. Uh, to model check property uh, expressed in a VACT live box on feature transition system uh, in a family based manner with VMC. Uh, the, the source code is available on GitHub and uh, a pre, pre configured Docker image is available on Docker Hub. Here we have the two QR code if someone wants to check the source code right now. Um, so um, what uh, what uh, FTS for VMC does, uh, it provides a simple UI to work with the proposed tool chain. It uh, implements uh, automatic ambiguities removal using the, the previously shown procedure that uh, Maurice showed earlier and convert an ambiguous FTS into model transition system compatible with VMC. This is the tool chain and the blue section is the, is the one that uh, FTS for VMC implements. Uh, uh, before uh, showing FTS for VMC, uh, I show how a feature transition system is uh, expressed uh, as an input for, uh, for FTS for VMC. We can see that uh, we use the graphics.format and we, we use a direct uh, direct graph and we have uh, uh, attribute on the direct graph that show the the feature model for the wall uh, FTS and then for every for every for every transition we have uh, inside the label uh, the action then a vertical bar and the feature expression for the the specific transition Okay, now I show you a little bit of FTS for VMC. This is the UI. It is a web, uh, a web tool. We can, uh, by clicking on select FTS model, we can choose to upload a model. And after uploading, after selecting a model, by clicking on upload model, the model is loaded on the server. We can see under the graph tab that the model is uh, rendered using the graphics library. And under the source tab, we can see the source code of the uploaded FTS. Uh, after uploading the FTS, we can, uh, we can either execute a full ambiguities analysis or a liveness analysis. 
The main difference is that the liveness analysis will only look for uh, hidden deadlock. And uh, as shown previously, this uh, type of analysis is much faster than the full ambiguities analysis that will also look for the transition and false optional transition. Uh, these uh, two methods are implemented using the static analyzer developed by Michael Leonard. And uh, after a complete full ambiguities analysis, we can see under the console tab the output uh, of the process. And inside the graph tab, we can see highlighted in green the ambiguity. In, in this case, these are all, are all false optional transition. Uh, but if we select the mind pump model and execute a full ambiguities analysis, we can see, for example, that uh, hidden deadlock are highlighted in red. Uh, after uploading a, a model and executing an analysis, under the summary tab, we can see the, the list of all transition in a table format. Uh, after uh, after up uploading and uh, a complete analysis of the model, we have uh, three options. We can select to remove the transition and hidden deadlock state, or we can select uh, or we can remove only false optional transition. By clicking on remove false optional transition, we can see a preview of the transformation applied, and we can see that most of the that um, sorry that all of the false optional transition are now uh, have now feature expression true. If if we decide to remove uh, that transition and the hidden deadlock state, we can see for for example that uh, the state uh, S twenty now is uh, a new a new transition to an explicit deadlock state, where the feature expression is the negation of uh, the disjunction of the feature expression of the other trans outgoing transition from state S20, which was a hidden deadlock. Uh, going back to the Vendi machine model, uh, we can re remove all the ambiguities. In this case, we can see that most uh, that uh, the false optional transition are now mass transition. And by clicking on apply transformation, we can update the, the file uploaded. Since uh, the, now the, the graph, the FTS is live because we have completely removed all possible ambiguities, we can, we can see by clicking on view model transition, the equivalent MTS. And we can see that, for example, change, which is now a mass transition, is rendered with a solid line while uh, the action free EPA, which are mutually exclusive actually, they, they, are, not, they are represented with a dashed line. After completing the, the process, we can, uh, we can now verify the, we can now verify property in the same manner uh, inside the VMC. So for example, we can verify that every time uh, pay action is executed, uh, we have that in the future, we'll either uh, execute uh, uh, a take between uh, state uh, eight and nine, or a cancel action between state three and four. Now, by using the OR operator, we can see that the formula is true and also holds for all possible uh, MTS variants. Uh, if, uh, for example, we require that every time a uh, pay action is executed, we only, we in the future will all, it will be always executed a take action. We know this is false because there is a path uh, using cancel and return. If we click on verify property, uh, FTS for VMC return that the formula is false. And since the formula is false, we can require a counterexample, and the counterexample is rendered as a graph. It's a graph, and we can see, for example, okay, by executing pay, change, cancel, and return, we have a complete uh, product that uh, never execute uh, 
uh, a take action. Uh, another, other, uh, another feature of the tool is that if we, for example, write a formula that is syntactically wrong, the tool will uh, return uh, an error and uh, specify me where it is there so we can fix it. And now this formula is false since uh, it is not always true that by executing a, a pay action, both uh, a, there exists a, a transition with the both actions. And uh, most uh, the result uh, inside the the different tab are downloadable by clicking on download the display result. So we can save the rendered graph or more important, we can save the unambiguous FTS. And uh, inside the re repository for uh, FTS for VMC are also available two, two command to execute the same type of operation in a command line, using the command line interface. So for example, we can execute this ambiguate on the, on a on one of the dot file. Okay, and now inside the, inside the folder, we can see that the newly, the newly unambiguous graph has been created. And we can see that the action, the false optional transition have been converted with feature expression tool. Okay, that's, uh, that's the end of my part. So if there are any questions. Okay, that looks like no questions. So thanks, uh, Franco and Giordano, for these uh, demos. Um, so I will start sharing, sh sharing uh, the screen for the, for the final part. That's just basically conclusions and wrap up. So there is a question coming up in the chat, I think. Oh, okay, great. Let's see. Ah, but his mic is not working. It looks like a question for either Giordano or Franco. Let's wait until we see the rest of the question. Okay, if we are talking about uh, FTS for VMC, currently under the, the web tool is not available. Uh, this was... Uh, a design decision because we wanted to focus on the feature transition system, but using the using the command line tool, you ah okay right. Uh, the question is if the the final model transition system can be exported to be used directly on VMC. Uh, currently, it is not available for on under the web tool. But there is uh, inside the repository, there is a, a file called uh, isambiguate.pi that is a Python script that you can use uh, using the command line interface to, to have the MTS output uh, uh, available to use then on VMC. Okay, so now that David is happy, so let's go uh, to the conclusion and outlook. Um, so we, we've we presented an efficient static analysis uh, of FTSs. Uh, the algorithm is scalable. We proved its correctness. Actually, that's in the paper. We didn't present that now in this tutorial, of course. And uh, we showed some benchmark experiments of very promising uh, performances. And um, what does this, uh, this uh, allow us? This allows an efficient verification of FTSs next to the ones on MTSs that we already had. So we can do this kind of family-based model checking that we had for MTSs with variability constraints, and we can apply it to a specific type of FTSs, those that are live. 
So once we've made an unambiguous there lie, and we can uh, verify both linear and branching time properties, okay, in this uh, VACTL logic. And all this has been automated by the tool chain that we have shown uh, several times. And uh, FTS for VMC is a publicly available front end tool. VMC is available on the website, and the sources can be shared upon request. And uh, then uh, we are currently working on uh, a transformation from uh, FTSs to Promola. Promola. Promola is the input language of SPIN, which is one of the best known LTL model checkers. And uh, the, the idea of this is basically uh, the following, so that we have a few minutes, I will explain this to you. So please recall this uh, slide that was presented by Giordano. So the basic message here is that we could use an old result uh, for FT for uh, the result was uh, published for MTSs, and we can uh, use this for FTSs in a specific format. So we have this uh, live FTS. We can transform it into an MTS in a very standard way. If a property holds for for it, then it will hold uh, for all products. Okay. So this is uh, what we have now. Uh, not that uh, a path in an so this is a definition in an LTS. It's called maximal if it cannot be extended further. And the model checking LTL formulas on an uh, LTS, this reduces to analyzing maximal paths. And the LTL formula is valid if it holds for all the maximal paths. So if we have this uh, information, then this means that this trivially carries over to FTSs if we simply ignore the feature expressions. So the second part of the, of the action labels. And then if the FTS is live, the set of maximal paths of any product is a subset of the of set of maximal paths of the FTS. So what does this mean? This means that we can uh, have a similar result also for, uh, for uh, FTS is going to uh, LTL model checking. Mm -hmm. So take any formula phi of LTL, if it is preserved, uh, so then it's preserved by live FTSs. So given a live FTS, which we know how to create, transform it uh, into, so consider the LTS by ignoring the, the feature expressions. If the formula holds, then it holds for all products, okay? So this is the same kind of family-based model checking now for LTL. So basically, it means that uh, some LTL formulas, those uh, specific ones, can be verified with SPIN. SPIN is a very well-known LTL model checker. So take an example here. We have uh, um, uh, the LTS labeled with uh, states, state labels. So it's a, basically a doubly labeled LTS in this case. But what is important here is the Kripke structure, right? So we have the state labels. And we have these uh, two formula in LTL that I have already shown before on, the, on some slides, in, I think in the second part earlier. And we can actually uh, automate now this, this uh, picture if we have this translation uh, from FTS to, to Promula. So remove ambiguities from an FTS. If it is live, and if the formula is an LTL formula, then we can verify this in a family-based way with spin. If the formula holds, then it holds for all variants. If it does not, I have to verify with an external tool, which is the case also if the formula is not an LTL formula or if the FTS is not live. Okay, for this to work, we need this translation from the FTSs to, 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 to Promola, which we've been uh, working on uh, right now. Okay, uh, so now the references, these are the basic references. So the, the first one is the, was this, this best paper at SPL 2019. Then we have the, the journal version that will appear very shortly in empirical software engineering. Uh, and then we have this uh, tool, uh, FTS for, uh, for VMC. Um, this has been accepted in the tool track of uh, SPLC this year, and it will be presented tomorrow. And uh, well, I would have put the link here. Maybe, maybe, maybe Giordano, if he's quick enough, he can put the link to the, to the video in the chat. But there's actually a 20 minutes video of this, uh, of this tool available. But well, those who have followed the tutorial uh, have seen it uh, live. And we will be presenting this very shortly also tomorrow uh, at the conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, so that's basically, basically it. 